uh, did you go back to New York with the $75,100? Yes, I did. Did you thereafter uh, hear from, um, well, did you thereafter receive uh, money again from Mr. Kalmbach? Yes, I did. Now, you expressed some concern about um, carrying this amount of money around with you. How were you traveling during this period of time? Uh, by airplane, uh, Eastern Airlines shuttle usually. And did you ever change your uh, mode of travel? Did you have a problem on the planes? Well, there was, a, there was a period of time uh, when, of course, with the hijacks and all, uh, they started a searching system uh, on uh, various airlines, <laughs> and uh, that was a little problem. And I got in the line one time to go back. It was uh, when I had probably only about 50,000 at this time, and uh, a fellow in front of me, two or three uh, persons in front of me, uh, was stopped and had to produce, I think, four packs of cigarettes or something, set off the alarm. So I went into a coughing fit, and I went down to Pennsylvania Railroad and took the train home. <laughs> In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons, acting individually or in combination with others, in the presidential election of 1972, or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington... NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. If William White, who wrote The Organization Man, could have produced much of the Watergate script so far, it was Damon Runyon's turn today. The witness was Antony Ulazowicz, former New York cop, who laid out all the practical difficulties of unloading 200,000 bucks in secret installments to the seven Watergate defendants. And he had the committee and the audience laughing more than they have in seven weeks of testimony. He also got the message sooner than anyone else. What they were doing wasn't kosher. There couldn't have been a more startling contrast with the next witness, a Mississippi gentleman rich with oil and real estate who volunteered his time to the Nixon campaign and found himself sucked into criminal activities. Fred LaRue has already pleaded guilty to conspiracy to obstruct justice. In his testimony today, he contradicted much of the testimony of John Mitchell, his close and good friend. LaRue helped conduct John Mitchell's initial probe of the Watergate break-in, and today he added some more clues to the character of the mystery man in this drama, G. Gordon Liddy. In a soft-spoken voice, LaRue talked about his meetings with Liddy, and he told how Liddy was ready to accept punishment for failure at Watergate. Uh, Mr. Liddy assured us that uh, uh, in any event that he would never uh, 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 reveal uh, uh, any information about this to, uh, uh, in the course of any investigation, even if it uh, led to him. But uh, if we were not satisfied uh, with that assurance that uh, though he was... Uh, I think personally, uh, uh, morally uh, opposed to suicide, that if uh, uh, we would instruct him to be on any street corner at any time, he would be there and we could uh, have him uh, assassinated. LaRue also told the committee that he came to the conclusion by late June that the break-in had been approved by someone at the committee to re-elect or at the White House and was funded by the committee to re-elect the president. Just a moment. We seem to have got our, our videotape a little bit backed up. I ready? think you'll agree when you see for yourself in a few minutes that in terms of personality, Tony Ulasiewicz and Fred LaRue couldn't be more different. Well, Stephen Hess, the Brookings Institution senior fellow who watches these hearings with us from time to time, has some preview comments about that aspect of it. Mr. Hess? Senator Howard Baker, as he so often does, nicely summed up the testimony of Tony Ulasiewicz when he asked the colorful New York City detective, who thought you up? The answer might have been Damon Runyon or Jimmy Breslin. Clearly, every congressional committee hearing deserves a Tony Ulasiewicz. 
And yet there's a serious side to what he said. Think perhaps of Ulasewicz in the role of the fool in a Shakespearean play, the person of low caste saying wise things in disguise. After all, it was Ulasewicz who warned Kambach, the clever presidential counsel of the dangers ahead rather than the other way around. It was Ulasewicz, not Kambach, who had that sort of smarts. Compared then to Ulasewicz's testimony, which may seem like comic relief, we next turn to Fred LaRue, who in a low, keyed, intense manner gives us testimony that is really the stuff of which men go to jail. And in this case, the men could be John Mitchell, Jeb Magruder, John Dean, possibly Comback, and finally, LaRue himself. All right, another obvious difference, of course, is the uh, New York ease of Tony Ulasewicz versus the Mississippi ease of, uh, of Mr. LaRue. All right, Mr. Hess will be back at the close of tonight's broadcast for further discussion of today's session. He'll be joined at that time by John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Center. Here's our nightly rundown of testimony to let you know what comes when. In the first hour, former New York policeman Anthony Ulazowitz recalls that he took the first payment of $75,100 from Kalbach in a hotel laundry bag and that he ultimately made four money drops to the Hunts, who distributed cash to the other defendants. But, Ulazowicz says, by September he had a shaky feeling about the legality of the entire enterprise. He says he still continued to follow orders, never acting without Kalbach's okay. In the third hour, he concludes his testimony, saying that part of his job was to acquire information on the sexual habits and drinking and domestic problems of potential appointees to the administration, or its enemies. Ulazowicz also says he collected information on potential campaign contributors. Fred LaRue begins to talk in the fourth hour, speculating that the Watergate plan was finally approved when Magruder got a call from Charles Colson. And LaRue recalls, after the plan aborted, campaign director John Mitchell suggested a good fire to burn incriminating material. In the fifth hour, LaRue says that he didn't consider the payments to the Watergate 7 as blackmail. And LaRue says he agreed that disclosure of the payments could create a threat to the election of the Republican ticket. LaRue concludes his testimony by saying he made a final payment early this year to lawyer William Bittman, only because John Mitchell said he should. Senator Irvin is about to open the day's hearings and begin the second appearance before this committee of Tony Ulasewicz. The committee will come to order, and counsel will call the first witness. Uh, Mr. Tony Ulasewicz. You were you were sworn in. You you took you uh, took the oath as a witness when you were here before the committee before, and this uh, same oath still covers your testimony. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Terry Lenzner, Assistant Chief Counsel, will question the witness. Mr. Ulaswitz, I see you have counsel today. Would you uh, identify yourself, please, sir? John Joseph Sutter, Mineola, New York. And Mr. I understand you have a, a brief statement you'd like to make, Mr. Sutter. I do. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure much to the relief of the committee, Mr. Ulaswitz does not have a prepared statement he desires to read. He is here merely for the purposes of answering questions from the committee, and I should like the record to indicate that he appears pursuant to a subpoena issued by the committee dated April 30, 1973, and served upon him on or about May 8, 1973. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sutter. Mr. Ulaswicz, uh, you testified here uh, about your relationships with Mr. Caulfield and making contact with Mr. McCord. I just want to uh, go back and ask you, were you contacted originally by Mr. Caulfield in February of 1969 with reference to uh, doing some investigative work? Yes, I was. Now, I understand the committee is not going to inquire into that area uh, in any detail at all today, but I do want to just ask two other background questions. One, were you also uh, interviewed by Mr. John Ehrlichman in May of 1969 at the VIP lounge at LaGuardia Airport. Uh, that is correct. And did, in June of 1969, did you meet Mr. Herbert Kalmbach here in the District of Columbia? That is correct. 
Now, on or about uh, June 28, 1972, did you receive a call from that same Mr. Kalmbach? Uh, yes, I believe it was on the 29th of June. And uh, can you tell us what he said to you and what you said to him? Uh, Mr. Kalmbach uh, asked me to uh, come down to Washington the next afternoon uh, that he uh, wanted to speak to me regarding an assignment. And did you thereafter, did you agree to do that? Yes, I did. And did you see him the next day? I did. Where was that, sir? It was in the Statler Hilton Hotel in his room. And can you tell us what he said to you at that time and what you said to him? Uh, Mr. Kalmbach uh, advised me that he had a, a very important assignment, uh, and he went at least uh, three times over uh, the statement saying that it was a, uh, a situation that developed that uh, he was asked to do something and needed my help uh, in doing it. Uh, he said that it was legal, uh, that uh, it was to uh, uh, provide funds uh, for persons in difficulty, uh, for payment of their counsels, and for uh, a payment to assist their families uh, during a, uh, some troublesome period. He uh, repeated the statement several times. He was very uh, ill at ease, very nervous, and we got to the point when I said, well, Mr. Kalmbach, uh, uh, just what is this now? And uh, the chair, says, well, I guess you have guessed it, that it's the Watergate situation. Mr. Lasswitz, uh, let yes. me just interrupt. Could you put the microphone more directly in front of you, sir, please? Thank you. And uh, he said, it's the Watergate situation. I guess you've guessed that. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, again, let me assure you that I, I would not in any way or fashion ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't engage my own services in. It is an assignment for me, and I'm asking you to do this. It will necessitate uh, confidential methods, possibly. He couldn't uh, go into uh, at that time as to what it might uh, completely take in. Uh, at a certain point in the conversation, he mentioned that uh, there may be a necessity of uh, communicating by telephone with me from time to time and what might be the best procedures. I said, if you mean as far as best procedures of uh, eavesdropping or anything of that type, that the telephone booth method is the only one. And I started to explain that, uh, however, wherever you want me to call you, you should give me the number in advance. You should check it out, know where I'm calling. And then I do it in return, and that went right over his head, actually, because uh, it, didn't, it didn't quite uh, work out that way. But we went into the phone booth deal, and we agreed to it. After that... Uh, Would you explain what the phone booth deal was, Mr. Lasswitz? Well, that if he wanted to be absolutely certain of uh, receiving a call at a cleared phone booth or so, he should have... Uh, the, the way it would be would to go into an area where he wanted me to call from a phone booth and establish that it was actually a phone booth. But we did make an arrangement later where, where I did furnish him with numbers. A phone booth? A phone booth. Did you also talk about names that he and you could use to contact each uh, other? Yes. Mr. Kambach agreed to use, uh, uh, suggested that when it, whenever he might call me in relation to this matter, he would use the name Novak. And that would be just strictly for myself. The... Uh, in the course of that, he said that if another name would probably be necessary, it would be John Rivers. And now, who's, uh, who was supposed to use that name? Uh, he, he anticipated that I might use that name in contact with distributing this money to the people that uh, would be necessary. At a point in the conversation, he uh, said that he had the money with him, and it was $75,100, which he gave me. It was in $100 bills. And what did, the, what did you uh, put it in? I went to the closet in the room and took a laundry bag and put the money in a laundry bag. Now, going back to the code names, um, do I understand it correctly, Mr. Elaswitz, that when he called you, uh, he, would he would call your home and say, this is Mr. Novak calling? Correct. And would he leave a number for you to call back? Uh, it developed to that, yes. And what would you do after what, you... What, it, what happened when he'd call Mr. Novak, when he'd say it's Novak, after our initial call, uh, which I supplied him with telephone, public telephone numbers, I would go to the telephone booth. And uh, we had a, and he'd give me a time, usually about a half hour, allowing me time to get to the phone booth, and then he'd call me at the booth. Now, uh, did you go back to New York with the $75,100? Yes, I did. Did you thereafter... Uh, <laughs> hear from, um, well, did you there have to receive uh, money again from Mr. Kalmbach? Yes, I did. And I'd like to uh, get your receipts 
um, all at once here, if I can. Where was the next place that you received money from Mr. Kalmbach? At the Regency Hotel in New York City. Approximately how much? Uh, Forty thousand dollars. And approximately when was that? Uh, that would have been in July of 1972. Of 72. Where was the next uh, delivery? Uh, at to the you? Uh, Hilton here in Washington. Twenty-eight thousand nine hundred dollars. Again, approximately when was that? In July. <clears throat> And, the and then my recollection is the final amount was $75,000 at the airport or in in uh, Los Angeles opposite the uh, Orange County Airport. All right. Now, going back to the original $75,100, what denominations was that in? Did you $100 bills. And where did you keep that cash? I kept it at home. Did there come a time when you uh, received these other amounts that you left them somewhere else? Yes. Where was that? Uh, in a safe deposit box. Now, after you got back to New York, did you hear from Mr. Kalmbach again? I did. And what, what instructions, if any, did he give you? Uh, he mentioned, uh, he uh, told me to call a Mr. Caddy. Mr. Mr. Caddy? Yeah, right, Mr. Caddy, to come back to Washington, D.C., and call Mr. Caddy. Uh, and he supplied me with a telephone number. How soon after you left Washington did he tell you that? I, it probably was the same evening or the next morning. And what did you do? Did you go down to Washington and call Mr. Caddy? I did. And what? Could you tell us the conversation you had with him? Um, I called Mr. Contact with Mr. Caddy, uh, and he uh, suggested that he would. Uh, now, prior to this, is when Mr. Uh, uh, Comback said, uh, "Tell him that," uh, and was one of the code names. We had gotten into other names, uh, uh, Tom. Tom Kane and John Ferguson and Tom H. Smith. So there was a little confusion once in a while on that. Now those, who However, gave, at this who gave you those instance, names, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Combine and myself in conversation is kind of backup. However, uh, with the, in this case, he instructed me to use, I believe it was John Rivers, when I called Mr. Caddy. And that I, uh, at this conversation, I was to say the purpose of my call to Mr. Caddy was that I was asking the cost of a script, of a play, uh, plus the salaries of the players, uh, which I did. I contacted Mr. Caddy, and he responded and said he would meet me in a restaurant sometime in the afternoon uh, here in Washington, D.C. And just to clarify, you did you identified yourself to Mr. Caddy as Mr. Rivers, is that correct? I believe Mr. Rivers, yes. In most of these transactions, it was uh, Rivers. Was there any reason for the code name Rivers for you to use? No. Now, did you go to that restaurant in Georgetown? Yes, I did. And what happened there? Uh, I waited for Mr. Caddy's arrival. However, a phone, come, a phone call came in. Uh, I was paged by the bartender. Mr. Caddy got on the phone and said that he couldn't meet me. After speaking to somebody in his office, in the attorney's office, that he could not meet me, would I be able to come and see him? Uh, I told him I would get in touch with him. My instructions originally with Mr. Kambach was uh, that I enter no negotiations at any time, as he would not enter negotiations. This is refreshing my memory again. And another thing he said, that uh, I am to do, if I receive the amounts or so, I am not to deliver anything until I get in touch with Mr. Kambach. And throughout these, continually throughout these negotiations and drops and whatever may come up, uh, this was the pattern, that uh, I would uh, uh, make the contact as directed, but I would take no action until I reported whatever was said or done to Mr. Kambach, and then I would uh, await a return call from Mr. Kambach to whether to proceed or not. In this case, I reported uh, Mr. Caddy's message, and Mr. Kambach uh, said, well, uh, Lee, probably uh, uh, give me the number you're at. That's at a phone booth here in Washington. I'll get back to you. Uh, did he call you back? Uh, my recollection, he did. He called me back, and I think at this instance, uh, it was call Mr. Caddy again. This might have been an hour or so later. I called Mr. Caddy again, and uh, we, we got nowhere uh, as far as any costs. I am now picturing that I'm going to deliver this 75100 which I got under my arm, and, uh, and, and he is not going along with it. And well, I you, saw, you I had called, the money with you on that date? Oh, yes. How did you carry it on that date? I carried it in a, uh, in a brown bag with, uh, you know, the ordinary type of with a little uh, string around it. You know, sometimes carrying what's most obvious doesn't raise any suspicion. Carrying an armed box would ask for trouble. So uh, you're just carrying your lunch. Carrying my lunch. All right. 
nevertheless, uh, I got to uh, uh, back to Mr. Comback, and this was a series of calls. And in somewhere in this, we, uh, uh, Mr. Caddy suggested that I should come up uh, to the office, uh, that they would have a uh, whether there was a corridor or a separate office, and that we would not be be observed, etc. And so again, I had a report back to Mr. Comback. And I think these calls might have been going California-wise by now. I'm not too certain. Uh, and then he would uh, intend to get back to me. However, there was a delay. Apparently, he couldn't reach whatever, whomever he was attempting to reach. The communications were not there for some reason or another. And I probably went back to the city. Uh, and, and, the, and the final result being that was it with Mr. Caddy, and we never did meet. Well, at some point, did Mr. Comback tell you to drop the whole caddy business? Yes. Now, I take it you were having uh, these conversations phone booth to phone booth between yourself and Mr. Comback? That is correct. And uh, were you loaded down with change, uh, Mr. Lasso? Oh, yes, indeed. And how did you carry that change? Well, when I started out, I started with kind of a little box deal. And when I uh, finished up, I had a, uh, a bus guy, uh, one of these things that you click on, <laughs> with quarters and dimes and nickels. It's true. It's true. Well, after you got back from... <laughs> after you got back to New York, did you again receive instructions from uh, Mr. Comback? Uh, yes, just about the time that it ended with Caddy, in which we got nowhere, and I still had the 75,100. Uh, I was asked to call a, uh, a Mr. O'Brien using the name of John Rivers. Did you call uh, him? I called Mr. O'Brien, uh, received a very uh, uh, tart kind of brush off uh, response, and that was the end of that conversation. It was one phone call. He showed no interest in any script, players, or any type of message that I was relating. So you were giving the same, uh, same instructions routine. by Mr. Comback to talk about a script, a scenario, the players? Uh, yes. Did you call Mr. Comback again, telephone booth to telephone booth? I did. And, and tell him the I told him exactly as I've related here. Did he get back to you again with other instructions? He came back and gave me another, uh, an, another uh, person to call. Now, it wasn't a person. He gave me a telephone number at this time, and there's no name involved. To the best of my recollection, it was call, and, and when it's answered, the fellow will be expecting a call, mention uh, your John Rivers or whatever name was appropriate at that, that he then w it would have to be Rivers, I imagine. And I called this gentleman, and... Uh, Where was the number? Uh, Washington, D.C. area. And I may have called from the city of New York at that time, because running around with that 75-100 and trying to get rid of it was becoming a problem. Uh, so I called the, uh, the unknown... And uh, he said to me, uh, you can talk to the writer's wife. And I said to him, well, as far as the writer's wife, well, I don't have a phone number. And he says, well, why don't you do what I have to do, look in a phone book. So that was the end of that conversation. I hung up on him because you, apparently that was another one we're not going to get anywhere at. Did you report that back to Mr. Comback? I reported that back to Mr. Comback and had to wait his call back again. All of these were, again, precluded. I call him, wait for Comback, and, and I began to call him. Come back, come back calls. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 7610. <clears throat> well, did you get further instructions from Mr. Comback? Uh, yes, I then was instructed to call a Mr. Bittman in Washington, D.C., who I understood was an attorney. And what instructions did you have to talk with him? The uh, same thing, the cost of a script, the writers, and to get the figures on what, uh, the attorney fees, and uh, rather not attorney fees at this point, this cost of the script, the players, and et cetera. And you were using the same name, Mr. Rivers? I believe so, yes. And did you contact, did you call Mr. Bittman? I did. And did you speak to him? I spoke to Mr. Bittman, and I recall that the first conversations were with Mr. Bittman said, well, I understand. He, he was anticipating or expecting a call. Uh, he... Uh, I said, well, this is very unusual. He said uh, something like, I don't know if you're an attorney, but an attorney doesn't uh, anticipate fees and uh, costs uh, in this manner. Uh, and I said, well, I, 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 am not I am instructed not to negotiate in any manner. I understood that you would have a, uh, a figure, and I, uh, I told him that I am prepared at this time uh, if we can get down to this, because at this point I still wanted to get rid of all those cookies, 75,100. And he, uh, he brought in the uh, situation that uh, 
he, he wasn't prepared at that time. Something was not according to the way he liked, and I so reported to Mr. Combach, received my call back from Mr. Combach. They told me again to call to contact Mr. Bittman. At this time, Mr. Bittman, uh, now this is some period of time passes by, and uh, he said, all right, that his initial fee would be $25,000. Now, what period of time, Mr. Lasswitz, are we talking about? This would be uh, around uh, July 6th to the 10th in that, that period of time. That's your, you're talking now about your discussions with Mr. Bittman? With Mr. Bittman, correct. And uh, did you call Mr. Combach and tell him Mr. Bittman had indicated he wanted an initial fee of $25,000? I did. And what, did Mr. Com what was Mr. Combach's response? He said to deliver it to Mr. Bittman in any manner I saw fit. Did he give you any instructions about not being seen by Mr. Bittman? Oh, yes. Those, were, uh, those came in after the caddy call at... Uh, uh, somehow, apparently, conversations were, made, were arranged that I would now not be seen by anybody to do the money without being uh, observed or in a confidential manner. And that was Mr. Kalmbach's instructions to you? Correct. Now, you expressed some concern about um, carrying this amount of money around with you. How were you traveling during this period of time? Uh, by airplane, uh, Eastern Airlines shuttle, usually. And did you ever change your uh, mode of travel? Did you have a problem on the planes? Well, there was, a, there was a period of time uh, when, of course, with the hijacks and all, uh, they started a searching system on uh, various airlines, <laughs> and uh, that was a little problem. And I got in the line one time to go back. It was uh, when I had probably only about 50000 at this time, and uh, a fellow in front of me, two or three uh, persons in front of me, uh, was stopped and had to produce, I think, four packs of cigarettes or something, set off the alarm. So I went into a coughing fit, and I went down to Pennsylvania Railroad and took the train home. <laughs> well, now, you arranged, uh, as I understand it, Mr. Ulasiewicz, yes, sir. Uh, to furnish Mr. Bittman with $25,000 for the, for the script. Is that the, uh, was that the that is conversation? Correct. And... Uh, how did you arrange to deliver that, uh, that money? I contacted Mr. Bittman right from the lobby of his office building. Uh, I spoke with him, and he's, I told him that I had the cash. Uh, prior to that, I went out to a drugstore uh, in the area, bought a couple of envelopes and some scotch tape, and uh, I had to count out $25 from that 75 <coughs> one, 25000 from the 75 one original, which I did and put into a plain class brown envelope. I called Mr. Fitman from, his, from the lobby of his building. There was uh, two, two, uh, two or three phone booths, and on one side of the phone booth was a ledge with, with uh, phone books, and I called yeah. Mr. Bittman. And Mr. Yaswitz, let me just yes. interrupt at this point. Could you now approach the easel and uh, tell me if you can identify this first exhibit? Sure. Now, you were starting to describe, uh, Mr. Elasowitz, the, uh, yes, the, uh, where you left it. Is that the lobby of the building? That yeah, know? this is the lobby. These are the phone booths. These are elevated doors on either side. And that's Tony Elasowitz right there. Very good. Thanks, Tony. Now, could you, uh, can you just, can you hold the microphone up a little further? All right. And would you now uh, indicate on the photograph where you called from and what happened after that? I called from uh, this telephone booth to Mr. Bittman and told him that I had the, uh, the delivery and, he, and that would he come right down and that it would be on a ledge at the telephone booth. Now, this gentleman is standing where the ledge is. There are a series, there's two or three or four telephone books, and there's a ledge above it with kind of a space. And I told him there'd be a brown sack and that the money would be lying right on the thing, and if he'd come right down, walk right to it, pick it right up, and go immediately back in the elevator, I would be satisfied. Now, thereafter, did uh, an individual come down the elevator? Uh, he, we had a description of clothing as, I, clothing, as I recall, that he'd be wearing a brown suit or something at that time. And did somebody come down wearing those clothes? Yes. And what did you, where were you at that time? I was in a telephone booth. I had it half shut, 
There was another person in a booth. The, these booths, incidentally, on a weekday are very heavily used. There's a, uh, a uh, newsstand section in front uh, and quite a bit of traffic on a weekday while it's, this was taken on a Saturday, I believe. Uh, he came right out and did as, as uh, we agreed, come out of this elevator, the first elevator, and walked right over, picked it up, walked right back in and went up. All right, now, Mr. Lasswitz, rather than having you go back and forth uh, several times uh, between the table and the easel, I'd like to go ahead and continue, if it's okay, and have you describe other uh, contacts that you made with individuals to furnish the money. Did there come a time later when you, Mr. Comback instructed you to furnish funds to Mrs. Hunt? Yes, that's correct. And did you have a, a conversation with Mrs. Hunt where you arranged to furnish her with some funds? Yes, I did. And can you just describe uh, what you told her, how she could pick up uh, her money? Uh, I told uh, Mrs. Hunt that at a certain time in the day, and I picked an, uh, an hour thing, to come into the lounge here through the American Airlines, uh, which is a long lounge uh, reading, leading right through the building, uh, ticket desks at one side of it, seats in the center of it, and a very busy area. And that about the center of that, she should check with the time, I have a large clock that so that it'd be almost exactly at that point. If it were 12 noon, and if she saw 5 to 12 and that, to please not to, uh, to go back out and come back at about that time. Uh, she followed the instructions explicitly at all time. In the meantime, when I arrived in Washington, whatever uh, drop I would have at the time, I put in this particular uh, locker, and I would take the key, and just before, uh, when I'd call her with the instructions, now five minutes before I knew she was coming, well, that's a little precluded. It was a s opposite and about 25 feet away across towards Northwest Orient Airlines. There's a series of telephone boots, five or six boots, with uh, five or six boots, and there's a newsstand uh, across, and there's a bit of traffic. I, uh, before making the arrangements, uh, I, I uh, spent some time uh, observing the telephone boots, and of all the boots uh, watching people going in and out, uh, the most isolated one that for some reason people didn't use was the very end one. So that's the one where I made my arrangements to leave the key. Now, uh, five minutes or so prior, three minutes prior to the time that I would have tell her to come, I would go into this telephone booth, and underneath the, uh, where the coin drop is, I would uh, scotch tape a key to the locker where I had uh, made my drop. And she, uh, uh, then I would leave that area and either go by the newsstand opposite, or uh, this would be where the phone booth would be. And this is a lounge. And the way she'd be coming through would be in this direction. Uh, this is a window uh, for airplane observation by the public, etc. And I would probably be seated in this area, walk there, or be a little further behind, but I could watch the booth. And she would come right. Her directions were the same thing. No one has to take her right in the booth, remove the key, go over to the locker. The locker would be in this direction, about 25 feet, I guess, or so, across the uh, corridor. Now, uh Now, uh, before she arrived on the first occasion, did you also uh, have a description of her, the clothes she was going to wear? Uh, yeah, she mentioned that day she'd be wearing a blue outfit, and I think she set her hair in a, uh, in a clip, back of her shoulders. Now, I, I believe on May 19th of this year, when we went out to that uh, phone booth with you, there was still some scotch tape underneath that telephone box. Is that, right? that is correct. Now, did you observe her on... Uh, on the first occasion, come by, pick up the key, and uh, go over to the uh, box, which I think is N301, and remove uh, the funds that you had left there. That is correct. And uh, did you see her do that on other occasions? Yeah, on two other occasions. Now, the first occasion, how much money did you leave in that box? Uh, $40,000. And the second occasion? I'll just refer to the notes to... Uh, sure, take your time. I mentioned... Uh, there was one occasion that Mr. Hunt came. I mentioned, too, there were actually four drops to the Hunts. I don't want to confuse. There were four drops to, to the Hunts, three to Mrs. Hunt and one to Mr. Hunt. Is that correct? Correct. How much did you leave there the second? There was 43,000 the second time, 18 the third, and 53,500 on the last occasion, which was uh, September the 19th. All right, sir. Now, um, I take it you had the telephone booth the telephone booth under observation uh, from the lounge uh, after you left the key until some 
at some point when Mrs. Hunt picked up the key. Correct. And what if somebody had come in and uh, found that key there, Mr. Milasiewicz, while you were watching? Well, uh, he would be very quickly relieved of that key. Well, I think that's the best I can answer. That's why I post posted myself in that position. I take it that was the purpose of keeping the, the booth under observation. Correct. Now, did there come a time when you were instructed by Mr. Kalmbach to deliver funds to Mr. Liddy? That is correct. And uh, do you remember approximately when that was? Uh, that was in July of 1972. Uh, and uh, did you contact Mr. Liddy and give him instructions as to how that money would be delivered? And I how, did. How much was that, by the way? $8,000. All right, sir. Now, would you explain uh, what you told Mr. Liddy? I contacted Mr. Liddy. I had obtained a phone number from Mrs. Hunt. She had made those arrangements, saying that he'd need money, and uh, gave it to Combat, came back to me uh, to deliver the money, the 8000 And uh, I told him to, uh, in that conversation, he started, uh, and it was the only one I had with him, he started, at that occasion, started saying something about, uh, again, he thought I was in policy making or some contact, and he said, uh, I, uh, you can check with anyone. I'm a stand-up guy, et cetera. And I said, uh, Mr. Liddy, I, I, I'm only in delivering something, a package. He says, okay. And we made arrangements. And in this instance, I uh, placed the money in a locker at this end at the bottom. In another area of National Airport, the main lobby where Eastern Airlines comes in first, the money was placed in the bottom locker here. The others were not available higher. And uh, I placed the key in an envelope and, so, uh, on, and placed it on a ledge here by the window and myself in a position back to observe, much in this fashion. And That's he, next to that travel? Uh, that next to this uh, mutual insurance. of Omaha insurance situation here. Then the, uh, the, uh, he, he came in and did as instructed, uh, told me he'd be wearing a shirt or so and the uh, description. He come by, walked by me, and I proceeded up. Uh, there's a, a flight of stairs uh, which uh, lead to an upper deck. And I watched him from up here. Uh, I lost sight of him. Uh, he, had, uh, he had gone into a, there's a corridor leading in here, and he probably uh, thought that the, uh, the, there were lockers in this area, and he went, however, he come back in a, maybe 30 seconds or so, and did checking his, looking at his key, went, opened the thing, and took the money. Now, did there come a time when you were asked to deliver money to Mr. Fred LaRue by Mr. Kalmbach? Yes. Was that? In September of 1972? That is correct. And approximately how much was that? $29,900. <clears throat> and what arrangements did you make with Mr. LaRue to deliver that, those funds? Uh, the instructions at that time from Mr. Kambach were uh, to, uh, there were two deliveries that day, one earlier to Mrs. Uh, Hunt in a manner as I described, and a second one uh, to, uh, to Mr. LaRue. Shall I go in the entire conversation sure. at this well, point? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. LaRue, uh, Mr. Kambach said that uh, gave me a telephone number and said contact Mr. LaRue at 6 p.m. And Mr. LaRue lives in the Watergate apartments, which, of course, was a little surprise to me. Uh, now we're back into the Watergate deal. And he, uh, uh, he said to leave, Mr. LaRue suggested that I leave the package at the desk. And I said to Mr. Kambach that at no point have I been observed and I've been obeying the instructions as best as I know how. And now I certainly am not going to walk in and leave it at the desk because that's a third party. Uh, he said, all right, handle it any way you want, as usual, et cetera. And what I did is uh, as a garage uh, opposite where Mr. LaRue lived in the Watergate. His entrance uh, had one telephone booth, uh, and it was very, uh, it was being used quite a bit, so I, I didn't, didn't go there. But I hated to go to where I did go, which was the Howard Johnson Motel across from Watergate, which was used in the original situation. And that's where I wound up. Uh, I placed the key. I called Mr. LaRue and asked him to, that I had a package. He was waiting to call, 6 p.m. exactly. He was awaiting the call. He says, fine, he would be right down. I had never met Mr. LaRue. I asked him to put two magazines under his arm and come across the street, come in through the motel entrance, and the money would be on a ledge at the, in a motel. Uh, when he came out, it's a wide street. He, uh, I watched him through the motel window here, uh, and he had the two magazines. He stopped at the island because of the heavy traffic. When he stepped off the island, he was now approaching. I laid the money on the ledge in the envelope, and I proceeded through a door back of the cigarette machines, and I could see him come in, take the, uh, pick up the money, hesitate a moment, go right out and back to his apartment. And so you had the money and him under observation until such time as he picked it up? That is correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Lasswitz. Can you return now to the 
table and we'll go back to pick up some more of your conversations with Mrs. Hunt. Now, after you delivered uh, your $25,000 to uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bittman, did you so advise Mr. Kalmbach that you had made that delivery? I did. Now, after that, did you uh, receive um, another phone call from Mr. Kalmbach instructing you to contact uh, the writer or the writer's wife? Yes, and, I, uh, and he gave me the telephone number to the, uh, to the writer's uh, residence. And who are you to call on that first occasion? Uh, the writer, who would be Mr. Hunt. And uh, did you have any instructions? Uh, what were you supposed to say to him? Uh, that uh, a, a, a listing of the cost of the script and the uh, same routine, the actors, and who may be concerned in that show. And did you call the number that Mr. Kalmbach had given you? No. The n telephone number? Yes. Did you call a number? Did yes, you? I did call. And did you have a conversation? Did you ask for the writer and talk to somebody out there? Yes, uh, I spoke to a, a male whom I assume was the writer. Uh, he was uh, evasive uh, and wouldn't recognize my call in any way, uh, and that was the end of that call. And I got back to Mr. Kambach, who then uh, pres uh, I had to await a return call. And the return call was to call again and, a and that uh, if the writer's wife asked for the writer's wife. Did which, you, of course, was Mrs. Hunt. And did you uh, call and ask for the writer's wife and talk to somebody? She answered the phone. And you identified yourself as Mr. Rivers? Right. And, and what she, the... she, she, she was expecting to call so that the contact was uh, first made at this point with Mrs. Hunt. Could you describe uh, the conversations that you had with Mrs. Hunt? Yes. The, uh, we, uh, I told her that... Uh, I was calling regarding the figures, and Mrs. Hunt stated uh, that uh, she went, she started with a, a list of uh, necessities uh, of uh, attorneys, attorney fees, and she went into uh, the persons down in, in uh, referring to people down south the, uh, with the necessity for aid. Uh, well, I take it, Mr. Uh, you asked what you had a series of phone conversations during July of 1972 with Mrs. Hunt? That's correct. Uh, well, can you uh, tell the committee um, the substance of what those conversations concern? Initially, uh, Mrs. Hunt was, uh, uh, when she went into figures, I, I, did, I would inform her that I'm not to negotiate, that I was simply in a position to deliver and uh, whatever was necessary. However, uh, she interjected herself continually, an early uh, feeling that I would pass a message on or something of that type. Uh, uh, she started out initially with, in the early conversation uh, requesting rather than demanding or building up, but she, uh, she would uh, mention, she started with herself, the fact that uh, she had lost her uh, own job due to this, and that should be taken in consideration and that uh, with that there are certain things with the job that, uh, for instance, uh, hospitalization and whatever benefits might be there, that she had, that had been lost. And that uh, she thought that perhaps ten or fifteen thousand dollars might, and this is, no matter how many times I'd, I would try to stop her, she would continue in with that. And she said she's sure the same situation was occurring. There was apparently, uh, and the calls I cannot separate completely, but where it started from, uh, from the four instances of dropping the money, she started with this uh, suggestive way and then got into it heavier each time. Uh, subsequently, uh, she would mention the uh, necessity of uh, uh, that uh, Mrs. Liddy uh, was undergoing uh, some psychiatric treatment or might be uh, undergoing, that she was a school teacher and that uh, she probably wouldn't be able to work as a result of this and, and that should be another amount of money. Uh, when she spoke of uh, uh, course to Mr. Uh, to, the, uh, to Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hunter, husband, Mr. McCord, Mr. Liddy, she gave figures of approximately $3,000 a month would be uh, satisfactory, and uh, she had hoped that uh, that might be done in some multiple so that it wouldn't, we wouldn't go the, through this thing monthly. In addition, she mentioned the names of Barker and that he was particularly uh, 
and this is in, in, in the four conversations, not, not all in this one. I understand. And, and it started, it built up in that, and no matter how many times I would try to say that I'm not negotiating, she got her bid in, and of course, uh, it continued in that manner. When she got into Barker, she explained that uh, Mr. Barker had some pecu peculiar problems in this matter. He was dealing with the people down south, that the others uh, may have become involved, others than they started originally, uh, that there were some bail problems down south. Uh, she mentioned that she, in the course of these conversations over this period of time, that uh, she was the one who was delivering the money uh, to the various people after she had uh, obtained it from me. Uh, then they mentioned, uh, she mentioned Sturgis, Gonzalez, Martinez, and when she had mentioned uh, with, uh, with Barker, she mentioned uh, this, uh, a, a sum of $10,000 uh, for under the table. Uh, and then she mentioned uh, Barker with his problems with other people, suggesting that there were others uh, possibly involved. And this is towards the uh, towards the uh, final cause. So that well, now, the, when now you, and she went, excuse with, me. With reference to Mr. Barker, let's just stick with him for a second. When she made reference to him, uh, she was asking or seeking a specific sum of money. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, uh, with Mr. Barker. She yes, was, sir. She was asking a, uh, a sum of money which uh, wound up to uh, $23,000. And how did she break that down? She broke it down, 10000 for bail, 10000 under the table, and, and $3,000 for other expenses he was incurring with either coming up in this area and going back down or suggesting something of that type. And then when she spoke about her own expenses for, I take it, travel for delivering these funds, right. how, she, how much was she seeking in, for the, uh, her $5,000 expense? for her personal expenses. And when she talked about her travels, uh, did she also discuss with you uh, uh, her concern about the people down south and what assurances they might be given? She wanted to, uh, uh, she was concerned that they receive uh, money likewise for the support of their families and for attorneys. Well, was there any discussion concerning the, uh, uh, the impending trial? and its effect on the people down south? Yes, that some of them were getting uh, uneasy, were getting nervous, and, uh, and she intimated that uh, unless the money was uh, forthcoming, that, that, uh, that, that would certainly would help alleviate the situation. Now, you spoke about multiple sums, uh, I, and I take it, by the way, that you were transmitting these requests, these, these uh, concerns of Mrs. Hunt to Mr. Kallenbach on a... Continually. And, and no action taken until he'd come back with an answer. And was there an answer on the multiple sums that the Mrs. Hunt was seeking for Mr. M for the defendants? The uh, yes, it would case? be fifteen thousand dollars to uh, McCord, Liddy, and Hunt. Uh, Six thousand to Barker. Four thousand to Sturgis. Two thousand to Gonzalez. Two thousand to Martinez. And uh, for how long a period was that to cover? Uh, five months. Now, in a later phone conversation with Mrs. Hunt, did that become a matter of concern? Yes. Uh, she said that it was ca causing a problem down south uh, because uh, it so happened that uh, they were concerned because the five months ended up in a period just after the election. And from that, I gathered that they feared that that was deliberate. And I reminded Mrs. Hunt that she is the one that brought this matter up and that I was cutting it off, and as, as I did with the negotiations, and I said, I certainly don't think that's any, any situation here that I'm concerned with. You will have to stick to the amounts and et cetera, cost of the script, et cetera. Now, uh, when you say down south, by the way, Mr. Elasowitz, what, what are you referring to? Do you know what Mrs. Hunt was referring yeah, to? Yeah, the Florida area, Florida. Now, was there also a discussion with Mrs. Hunt about the attorneys in yes. the case? Yes, there was. And would you tell us what what uh, she said to you about the attorneys. Uh, she said the attorneys, uh, and she mentioned names of the defendants and their attorneys. She mentioned uh, $25,000 for Bittman for Hunt. Now, this was in addition, and I don't know if she knew that I delivered a 25, but she did present to me again that in this text that uh, Hunt and Bittman, 25000 that McCord with Lee Bailey, 25000 Liddy with Marulis, 25000 Barker with Rothblatt, 25000 the three others, each 10,000, a total of 30,000. All right, and you were transmitting again those uh, figures to Mr. Combat. <coughs> Correct. Now, when you've delivered your first uh, delivery of $40,000 to Mrs. Hunt at National Airport, how was that figure arrived at? Uh, Mr. Combat gave me that figure. And uh, at that time, and it was the only time in these, that he 
he try, uh, in that message was to, to say a certain amount for uh, people, and it was uh, like a down payment because it was obvious that the 75000 was not going to cover into what we were getting. And uh, as a result, you later picked up at various locations additional, additional funds. <coughs> Uh, by the way, when, did there come a time when you totaled up the amounts of money that Mrs. Hunt was seeking? Well, it was, uh, yes, it was in the vicinity of four hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And uh, did you have a conversation with Mr. Kalmbach concerning uh, that figure and uh, Mrs. Hunt's demands on you in uh, California when you went to pick up uh, uh, the seventy-five thousand dollars. Yes, there. that was the uh, that was in, in in August, and it was the uh, the last uh, pickup from Mr. Kambach. Uh And uh, shall I go through it? Yes. Why don't you tell us uh, what you said to he, him? He picked me up you. in his car at the airport or in in Orange County Airport, and uh, we sat in the car. And uh, in all these converse, just even prior to this, I already had suggested to Mr. Kambach that this thing has definitely gone a different direction than originally anticipated. Originally anticipated being that 75,100 was going to be the amount involved, and uh, and that the uh, person to get it would probably be one person. In that case, we started with Mr. Caddy, and it was a direct confrontation. Uh, in all these conversations, Mr. Kambach was as upset about it as I was, as I related to him. He he certainly didn't like it in any fashion, no more than I did. So we got along very well along that score. Uh, and when we met at the automobile. Uh, I got in the car, and Mr. Kambach said, uh, Tony, uh, what, what, what's your opinion of all this? And I says, well, and I'm going to try to recall some exact words, because they were, uh, <laughs> the first statement I made to him, I said, uh, well, Mr. Kambach, I tell you, something here is not kosher. And he, he kind of looked at me, and I said, well, it's, it's definitely not your ball game, Mr. Kambach. I said, uh, whatever has happened... Uh, we started with no negotiations. We're into negotiations. We started with 75, and now we're into a, a sum which uh, we've raised. We, we've now got something like 220,000 coming in, or 219 was the exact figure, and we're only approaching half. And I know that the next conversation I have, that figure has got to go up from all inferences and all. Uh, I said, uh, uh, certainly, Mr. Kai, you don't. I know your feelings in the matter. I know how we started, what you said. It was legal, but it was now leading up to a point, and I feel I must tell you, and he understood that that was my last to be mine, and I recommended very strongly to Mr. Kambach that uh, he likewise desist from it, regardless of how it started out and what were all the good intentions. And he said that he would. And, what was and he said that he would. He assured me that that, uh, not that he had to assure me, we were from different stations of life, however, uh, he did agree with me that this was time to, uh, to quit it. Now, after that meeting in California, did you receive a call from him in September of 1972 asking you to deliver uh, the uh, money that you've already described to Mrs. Hunt and Mr. LaRue. Yes. And would you just tell us what, what he said to you about that uh, delivery uh, and what you said to him? In, in th at that call, it was a little unusual because uh, uh, the inflection in his voice indicated irritation or, uh, or something unusual uh, as compared to any other time that I spoke with him. I, I couldn't fathom, of course, and I didn't ask him why. But he was very anxious that I... Uh, that I re, uh, that I be able to pick up that uh, the, uh, make the deliveries on the same day one around noon time to Mrs. Hunt, and one at 6 p.m. and it seemed very urgent. Now at this time I was residing in a town a day in Saratoga County, New York, and he wanted for the next morning. And I explained to him that there's a, a an airplane uh, a problem. Uh, likewise, uh, I mentioned to him. Uh, uh, my wire has about uh, 10 lines on it, and I mentioned to him that. Uh, uh, that the uh, laundry was in the icebox. And what was his response to that? And, uh, well, a kind of a long pause, and I says, well, you know, the money's in a vault in New York. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, oh, he said something to that effect. Now he knew that I did have a problem. However, I did resolve the problem. He, oh, the way we left that was that, okay, if I couldn't, would I please uh, take care of Mr. LaRue's request of 29.9? It was obvious I would miss the first one. However, I did get an early flight out, and uh, I got into New York City uh, just prior to the bank opening, or just about when it opened, did remove the money, which was the last of what we've had. And uh, I got into Washington, and I managed to make the arrangements, as previously described, of delivery to Mrs. Hunt in the same manner, and, uh, and then to uh, Mr. LaRue. And you delivered uh, $53,500 to Mrs. Hunt? Correct. On that date? And 29 dollars to Mr. LaRue. The next day, 
uh, or second day, uh, Mr. Kambach called me back and uh, uh, seemed <coughs> irritated again and said, as much as what happened, and I said, well, wh wh what's wrong? And he says, uh, he said, did you deliver the money? And I said, yes, I delivered both amounts. He said, did you deliver both on the same day? I said, I sure did. And he said, no kidding. I said, the words to that, I said, yes, both amounts were delivered. I don't know what was the significance of it, but apparently there was, and I said I delivered them on the same day. And he said, oh, fine. And that was our last conversation regarding this situation. And uh, that was approximately when that you delivered those funds? I don't know uh, September 19th. Now, during this period of time, uh, Mr. Elasowitz, uh, you were on Mr. Kambach's payroll. Is that correct? You, That's he was correct. still paying you for your investigative duties? That's correct. Did you receive any expense money yes. for these, your travel and whatever expenses you incurred? Yes. How much was that? $1,000. And do you know if Mr. Kambach received any expense funds? No, but at one point in the delivery uh, of the four deliveries to me, he had mentioned that uh, one of the amounts had $1,000. He had taken $1,000. He didn't indicate it was for expenses. He just said he took $1,000. Now, the figures that you gave us uh, for the attorneys and the defendants, uh, those are the figures that you understood were going to be paid to the attorneys and the defendants. That's correct. You don't have firsthand knowledge whether Mrs. Hunt did or did not transmit those funds. None whatsoever. However, that funds were transmitted because uh, if they weren't, why, of course, Mr. Kambach would have known it. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, no further questions at this time. Thank you. Before the minority side of the committee staff questions Mr. Ulazowicz, we're going to take a break. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the public broadcasting service. Of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearings, Minority Counsel Fred Thompson is going to turn over the questioning to his deputy, William Schur. Chairman, Mr. William Schur will ask questions of the witness. Mr. Ulasiewicz, you testified earlier to this committee that you were initially hired to do some discreet investigations and that this hiring was done through your connection with Mr. Caulfield. Is that correct? That's correct. And that you were, in fact, interviewed by Mr. John Ehrlichman. That's correct. What role did Mr. Kambach play in your prior employment with regard to these discreet investigations? Uh, he, uh, I met with him to discuss the uh, arrangements uh, to pay me. Uh, I was on Mr. Kambach's uh, uh, payroll. So in other words, Mr. Kambach's role prior to the events which you've just described uh, really uh, was just as a conduit for payment to you uh, for the services that you were rendering to Mr. Caulfield and Mr. Ehrlichman. Isn't that so? That's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. And did Mr. Kambach ever order you uh, to conduct any investigations? No. So that when he called you on the 29th, this was the first time that he really asked you to get involved in anything uh, by way of uh, activity? That is correct. Now, did you check with Mr. Caulfield and find out whether or not Mr. Kambach was operating with any authority? Uh, no. Uh, Mr. Caulfield, ha uh, Mr. Kambach had uh, g uh, received my telephone number from Mr. Caulfield, but I didn't discuss it with Mr. Caulfield in any way. Did Mr. Caulfield inform you that he had given Mr. Kambach your number? At, at a subsequent time, or I don't know if it even came up. It had no, uh, no real, uh, nothing was relative to me about that. But at the period of time, in terms of the 28th or 29th of June, 1972, uh, you merely relied on Mr. Kambach's um, statement. Only Mr. Kambach, correct. Did you ever incidentally, if I may say, another conversation that occurred, recalling as you're asking me, in that room with Mr. Kambach also, one of the, his instructions was that I discuss it absolutely with no one. And when we got into it later on a telephone to, uh, to make sure that, I said to Mr. Kambach, uh, uh, he, he at one point asked me how I would be delivering the money or how the undertaking uh, uh, would go on. And I said to Mr. Kambach, uh, it would be better if you didn't know what manner of method 
I am going to use to distribute it. I understand what you want, and I'm going to deliver it to the best of my ability. But I don't think you should know. I told him something like, Washington, be a sieve. If it leaks out of what I'm doing, you'll certainly always feel that I, I failed in your trust. And I said, as far as your situation with whatever your content, I will not know, and you will never accuse me of leaking out something I never knew. Then can I assume by your statement that you didn't discuss this activity with Mr. Ehrlichman either? Is that correct? Absolutely not. Now, obviously, this was an unusual activity, wasn't it, Mr. Ulasiewicz? Well, depending on who's doing it, uh, to me it was not so unusual. It was just another assignment. Had anyone ever given you $75,000 in $100 bills before to discreetly or surreptitiously deliver to people who were known defendants in a criminal matter? No. And I believe you testified earlier that you were for 27 years in New York City a member of the police force? That's correct. So wasn't this, in fact, an unusual procedure for you? Oh, well, no, I didn't consider it. Uh, I could, I, many assignments I had were unusual. Uh, but uh, as far as money, as far as the money and all, while I was in the police department, I did have occasion to uh, be present uh, with uh, two heads of governments in which there were sums of money involved, uh, I would say, two suitcases full, which sat next to me in a car, obtained in a bank in Boston, all strictly legal, of course. But that would be about $2 million. And there was a time but Mr. Lasswitz, was... you didn't deliver that money to defendants in criminal cases and in law no, no. And lawyers, did you? No, but uh, neither in this case, as Mr. Kambach and I were both in a frame of mind that we were not delivering it to defendants or at that time or whatever or they may be, when it strictly for legal fees, as he explained, and uh, for their families, and I certainly went along with that. Did, did you ever check with your friend, Mr. Caulfield, and find out whether or not this activity was authorized? No, sir. Now, going back to the, 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 the amount of money uh, that you had, I, from what I understand in your, your response to Mr. Lenzner, there was occasions, and I think there are at least four, that you were carrying at least $75,000 in a paper bag and traveling back and forth between Washington and New York City. Is that That's correct? That's correct. What was the arrangement that you had with Mr. Kambach if the money were lost? Uh, the thought never occurred to me. I was sure I wouldn't lose it. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that I carried it in such a manner, in an envelope rather than a paper bag, the only time the bag came in was with the laundry bag. But after that, it was a little substantial thing. If, if, you, carry a, if you carry a briefcase, if you carry any type of things that the attorneys carry and so forth, you are more apt to lose that. You may check it. You may lay it down by a table. You may make a phone call on a railroad station or an airplane terminal. If you're carrying a sack of papers or so, instinctively, you either have it under your arm or on, on your lap. So you would not lay it down. It never so in my opinion, that the best method to keep the money was exactly as I was doing. So then it never occurred to you to discuss with Mr. Kambach what risk there was in losing the money? We never discussed it, and I think Mr. Kambach was, uh, had trust in me that uh, it would go as, uh, as he directed. Let me ask you this. How would you have prevented someone from picking up the envelope that you left on the counter in Howard Johnson's with $29,900 in cash? Uh, I would uh, certainly grab it out of the fellow's hands, and that would be the end of that. <laughs> and what about if one of the keys fell off the phone booth before Mrs. Hunt got there? Well, the way I secured it, it wasn't about to fall off. As Mr. Lenzner mentioned, there still was some scotch tape even now, six months or eight months later. I had no problem taping it. I was satisfied the key wouldn't fall. My problems were others. And in one instance, it did happen when a fella come around uh, wiping the uh, insides of the phone boots with dusting it. And what and, did you uh, do when this fellow came along? I sweated a little bit for a few minutes. <laughs> but uh, but uh, actually, uh, and I'm not picking on a fella. I don't know who he was, but his, his cleaning process wasn't that thorough. And, uh, <laughs> was, were all the, all the sums of money that were delivered to you, the, uh, the four occasions that Mr. Kambach gave you the cash, were they all in $100 bills? No. At one point, there, was a, uh, there, was a, uh, there were 50s, 20s, and even a, a bundle of singles, maybe 50 or 100 singles. It was at one, one, only on one occasion. On every other occasion, it were $100 bills. And were those $100 bills in sequence? No. They were all, uh, they, they were mixed uh, from uh, old money to new money, and mostly old used my $100 bills. So you never worried about the money being traceable back to you? No concern whatsoever. Now, Mr. Ulasiewicz, you've discussed uh, with Mr. Lenzner some conversations that you had on the phone with Mrs. Hunt. And 
I'm curious to know what Mrs. Hunt's attitude was as she was making these increased demands to you for more money. Well, her attitude was, uh, I would say, uh, to milk a good thing would be the way to put it. Uh, she kept increasing the, uh, the amounts, of course, as I stated. Uh, and where as she began with, uh, and I know I speak of a lady who's gone, and I don't want to sound, uh, uh, she was very efficient. Uh, when I first got the uh, situation where I'd be talking with a woman on a situation like this, I was a little bit uh, concerned. However, it worked out very well as far as we understood each other. Uh, and uh, However, where, where it was a request, it became into a demand fashion almost. And well, when, when, if there was some concern or arguments between these conversations that were going back with me, she reflected that. Well, was her attitude one of the fact that she was entitled to what she was demanding? Oh, I think all the people were, felt they were entitled to it. Did she ever reflect to you, for example, what would happen if her particular needs were not met? No. Did she ever suggest, well, let's refer to the, the conversation concerning Mr. Liddy. She indicated to you that Mr. Liddy was desperate for cash, didn't she? That is correct. Did she indicate to you what the result would be or what the consequence might be if Mr. Liddy weren't given the cash? No. Well, why do you suppose she kept asking you for more money? Well, obviously, for, to keep everybody happy, whatever the situation might be. But uh, she for legal fees, and, uh, and as we took it, for legal, as we discussed, I assumed it was for help of the family. Now, if Liddy's family was in desperate need of money, uh, he's been cut off in salary or whatever it might be. This is the uh, terms that I took in him. I take it Mr. Martinez and Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Sturgis were not in quite entitled to the quality of legal representation that the rest were if they were well, only getting $10,000 and the others were getting twenty-five for their lawyers. Apparently. Well, it's the, the caste system, I guess. <laughs> what did she say concerning Mr. Barker? Did she make any reference to time that Mr. Barker might have to spend in jail? Uh, I don't think she ever referred to uh, uh, time in jail for Mr. Barker at all. There was one point in the conversations, and they were towards the end, where, where she indicated uh, that, uh, you see, like, uh, the drops were lower, and uh, whatever money I was giving, and, and she became concerned with and I think she might have wanted to use it as kind of a weapon, going back to me, thinking I was in policy or something of that type, where there was an insinuation that, uh, uh, that in addition, that the, the, the distribution, distribution of money that to help the families, et cetera, might work in with the possibility of keeping them stop worrying about jail sentences, as she'd mentioned. I'm trying to, she'd do it as a barter weapon uh, to me saying, well, you know, I'm trying to tell them everything's going to be all right, and then, and then I would cut her off and saying, I'm sorry, I, there's no negotiations, or will you give me the facts, and that's all. But yet you told her you had no authority to negotiate with her, Absolutely. and you had no authority to make decisions as Absolutely. to what she would get. That's correct. Well, let me ask you this question, Mr. Laswitz. Did you have the impression that perhaps Mrs. Hunt was talking to someone else other than you concerning the amounts of money that she was to get? Yes, sir. And what gave you that impression? The fact that the way Mr. Comback would come back to me and say how much to leave, plus the fact she would, she would indicate that of the amount she received, that they weren't enough to pay all these other fees, the high fees for attorneys, et cetera, and when would that money be forthcoming? So then, in other words, she would make demands to you. You would convey those demands to Mr. Comback. That is correct. Mr. Comback would subsequently call you back. Correct. And say she's to get this amount of money. And when you called her and told her you were making a delivery of that amount of money, there was no problem. Correct. So therefore, you can conclude that she had been in contact with someone else. That is correct. Do you know who she was in contact with? No, sir. Did Mr. Comback ever say that he spoke to her? No. He, uh, he indicated uh, n nothing of whom he was speaking to me. But there was a thing there that you mentioned with uh, uh, whom she was meeting with. There was a point in time in the conversations, I recall, that uh, she... she uh, conducted some type, there was a sit-down uh, deal uh, with, with defendants from time to time, uh, like what she mentioned with McCord's financial difficulties that he had to, uh, he was contemplating mortgaging his residence. And she'd mentioned the fellas down south, which were indicative of the fact that there was some meetings going on, but I don't know what home. That she was meeting with the defendants? With the defendants. But did she ever give you any indication that she had met with anyone from your side concerning how much money she was to be paid by your sources? Well, actually, I had no side. I was kind of a loner. 
However, I'll take it in with Mr. Kambach. The answer would be no. Well, you were then, then the only person that was conveying her initial demands or her subsequent demands. I was the only, to my, best of my knowledge, I was the only person that went through this with her. These, this but it was clear to you that after the demands were made that it was established and agreed by her to the amounts that you were instructed to deliver. Correct. Now let's refer to that conversation that you had with Mr. Kambach in the airport in Orange County, California. Uh, what date was that, if you recall? That was uh, August uh, 3rd to the 5th and I would, uh, in, in, uh, in California. And that entire conversation took place uh, in the car? In the car. And that was the occasion that you received the last payment of $75,000 from Mr. Kambach? That is correct. Now, Mr. Kambach has indicated yesterday in his testimony that he came to a conclusion somewhere along the way that he had to get out of this business of paying off uh, the monies. Was it your suggestion to him that you both get out of this business? It sure was. In other words, you brought it up to him. Yeah, and in phone calls prior to this meeting, likewise. And what was Mr. Kambach's response to these prior phone calls? He was getting more and more concerned about what was going on. And his reaction was much the same as my own thoughts, that we were engulfed or we were caught in, in some kind of a flow of events and, and monies that we did not contemplate, anticipate in any way. We had started out to do what we were considered uh, legal and uh, for purposes to assist. And Mr. Kambach, in all my conversations, if the word is exuded, that's what he did to me. We didn't have to go into it deeply. And, and when we met the automobile, this was the, this was the final thing that we were going to uh, go through. And I, I went, as I told you, I started right out with him and saying that, uh, as I did. In other words, the amounts that Mrs. Hunt was demanding and the amounts that Mr. Kambach were giving you were getting to be so vast that it was apparent that they were going beyond just paying legal fees and, and the needs, meeting the needs of the families of the defendants. That's a fair statement. And that was the reason that both you and Mr. Kambach came to the conclusion that you should get out of the thing. Yes, the money plus the way that we have to continue handling it and so forth. All that suggests that it's time to quit. Did you start to begin to, or did you begin feeling that you were becoming enmeshed in something that might be illegal? Uh, let's say that I had a little shaky feeling the way things were going. And were you beginning to get concerned for yourself? As for your involvement, for in myself matter. and Mr. Kambach, because I felt all along that the two of us were in a sweep of this thing. And your friend, Mr. Caulfield, was still um, your friend, wasn't he? Oh yes. Did you contact him? No. And you never discussed with him the fact that you were concerned about what you were getting yourself into? No, sir. Mr. Caulfield is a Washington resident, and any Washington resident is one of those holes in a sieve, no matter who he is. <laughs> So I would assume then that you felt the same way about Mr. Ehrlichman, who was living in Washington at the time. Well, uh, yes, but uh, you see, with Mr. Ehrlichman, the only conversation I ever had was that one at the airport when they hired me. Outside of that, I never had a phone call or a personal conversation with Mr. Ehrlichman. Yeah, but up until that time, had you ever done anything for them that you considered to be illegal? No, sir. And now you were caught in a mesh that might very much be involving you. That it may become at some point or looked at at the for the entire period of time that I was doing this with Mr. Kambach, it never occurred to me, and at this moment, I do not consider that I did anything illegal with Mr. Kambach. Neither did he, neither did I, as far as all the facts that were presented to me. But you did state that based on the amount of money involved and the demands that were being made, that you were obviously making payments to Mrs. Hunt and others that exceeded the basic needs of attorney fees and the family uh, survival. Correct. Correct. After you made your last two... Uh, Pay, uh, drop offs, right. which what was September 19th, September 1972. 19th, right. uh, did anyone ever contact you again about becoming involved in this type of an operation? No, sir. You were never asked to again make any further drop offs? No, sir. Did you ever hear from Mr. Kambach with a request that you make any further drop offs? No, sir. And no one else in. No one anywhere. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Now we. Thank you very much. Mr. Elizabeth, you've testified that you, over a period of three drops, distributed $153,000 to Mrs. Hunt. Isn't that correct, sir? 154000 in uh, four drops. 154000 
Is there any way we can corroborate that statement, sir? Is there any way someone can support you? Well, I think the best way would be that uh, if the money was not uh, dropped and picked up, that somebody would have done a lot of hollering about it because they were looking forward to get the money, and that's the only way, which I think would be substantial. Now, you've indicated that you are on Mr. Kombach's payroll during the year 1972, and your pay was $22,000? Uh, from uh, July of 1969, when I started, I was on Mr. Kombach's payroll, yes, sir. What sort of discreet investigations were you required to carry out? I beg your pardon, Senator? What sort of discreet investigations were you required to conduct? Uh, they were of a various nature uh, and ranged uh, from investigations of backgrounds of, of uh, persons to uh, organizations and uh, types of that. Uh. In carrying out your assignment, uh, did you find it necessary to uh, commit illegal acts, such as breaking and entering? No, sir. During the time you were working for the White House or for the committee, did you have contact with members of the intelligence gathering units of the Justice Department? No, sir. What about the uh, FBI? No, sir. The Treasury Department? No, sir. The CIA? No, sir. The Washington police? No, sir. This is your testimony, sir? Yes, sir. We have received information suggesting that you had contacts with the New York Police Department. Is that correct, sir? Well, I was retired, of course, from the New York Police Department. And yes, you sir. had access to their files? No, sir. Once I left the department, I did not have uh, access. I would have to conduct... If I wanted any information or inquiries, I would have to do it then as a private investigator. I might in any fashion, but I had no access to the records. And the allegation suggesting that you did have access to the files is false? Yes, sir. And it is your testimony that you had no contacts in the D.C. Police Department? No, sir. In your conversations with Mrs. Hunt, that she directly discuss the matter of immunity or pardon? No, sir. How did she uh, indicate to you that what she was asking for went beyond family expenses? Well, the, the figures that uh, she kept giving me, I still took in a text of, uh, of expenses to uh, four, four families and uh, uh, for their council fees. She would, uh, if she went overboard on the figures, it would be because uh, if it was another purpose, she would, whether she mentioned loss of jobs or whatever it might be, and she'd present a figure. Then you're changing your testimony because the first time you appeared, you testified that Mrs. Hunt did discuss with you the matter of pardons and immunity. Isn't that correct, sir? No, I didn't testify to that, Senator. No. I believe the record will so show. May we have the testimony, sir? We'll get it for you, sir. Thank you. You've testified that you distributed $219,000 for Mr. Kambach, and the last payment was on the 19th of September. And the trial of the Watergate defendants did not start until January. Is it your testimony that after the 19th of September you did not perform any similar mission for anyone else in distributing funds to these defendants? That's correct, sir. Are you aware of anyone who did? No, sir. Do you have any knowledge that the funds continued to go to the defendants from some other source? No, sir, I do not. Did you maintain your contacts with people like Mr. Liddy, Mr. Bittman? No, sir. You severed all contacts on the Correct. people in this assignment? Correct, sir. And you're still insisting that you had no access to the New York police files or the D.C. police files? You have me thinking, Senator, because apparently you have a point there, and I, I want to clear it up. I, I would have 
Uh, I have no, uh, by access, uh, could I walk into an office and look at a record or something of that type? No, sir. Or did you have friends there that would open the files for you? They wouldn't open, but I'm sure that if I made calls and uh, if I wanted, uh, if uh, they don't have to be on any particular instance as a private investigator, I might call a squad or a de uh, detective office or a precinct and uh, say that I'm a retired detective and if this is uh, within the uh, vein of uh, conversation, I don't want any official record, etc. I would get information. It might be about uh, almost anything that was available. But I wouldn't have access to records. I wouldn't receive records as such as per se. Uh, this information was available to the public? Not always, no. And once again, your testimony is that you never committed an illegal act in carrying out your responsibilities and your assignments. Yes, sir. I have a note here saying that the matter of pardons and immunity uh, came up in your staff interview. Yes, sir. That's probably where that originates, yes. Not and that was not a testimony, as my counsel reminds me. But in With your staff interview, yes, sir. It came in the latter part of, the, uh, of uh, the negotiations over where Mrs. Hunt was describing the monies down south and that things were being uh, were very hard to control down south. And uh, she said it, it would make it easier when, or if the money came through. And I was at this point is when she was, as I tried to describe, using a demand or, or, or some form of pressure by saying that if, if the money comes down here, that would certainly help her in some statement of a uh, lesser jail sentence or whatever it might be. Then it is your testimony that you did discuss pardons and immunity. I didn't discuss any pardon and immunity that I recall uh, in that fashion as you're putting it, Senator. I, I discussed light sentences, the inference of light sentences, and that, that did come up in, in that latter part in connection with that it would be easier for Mrs. Hunt to control these people. Or, Did you discuss the matter of light sentences with Mr. Kalmbach? No, sir. Didn't you think it was important enough? I may have mentioned it to him uh, with all the other material that uh, came in, but uh, it, at that time it didn't. It, it, I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't have sat on that very heavy because it, at that time, and it takes the time. It, I, I didn't accept it as such. I, I thought it was a wedge from Mrs. Hunt in order to get a commitment for more money. And if I told it to Mr. Comback, and I don't say that I did, but if I mentioned it, it would have been in a, in a passing manner. You've been a member of the police department now for 27 years, <clears throat> and I gather from your records a very distinguished service. And I presume that you know whether an act is legal or illegal. I'm certainly quite versed with uh, the criminal laws, not only of New York City, but of Washington, D.C. If a fellow detective came to you and he says he has observed a man dealing in large sums of cash, placing keys in phone booths, dropping envelopes at Howard Johnson motels, placing envelopes next to phone booths, lurking around the corners, using several drops, what would your conclusion be as to that person? Would your conclusion be that person was conducting an illegal act? No, I would be suspicious of his actions. <laughs> I did not consider myself, and at this time, do not consider that I uh, committed an illegal act. Were your actions the actions of a man who had nothing to worry about as far as the law was concerned? In distributing the money, yes, sir. In the manner of distribution? Yes, sir. The, when the proposition was put, when the assignment was given to me by Mr. Kambach, that was a stipulation that I do that in a discreet and confidential manner. And uh, that would preclude any other way, uh, in my opinion, if I'm to do it, that's, that's the way I would do it. And what I had in mind was the purpose of, uh, of this uh, situation, that this money was to go for legal fees, etc. And a man of Mr. Kambach's statue, who of course I knew was the uh, attorney to the president, and was telling, as stated to me that uh, it was legal in his consideration, that there was nothing illegal about it, and that was what was in my mind. Then the second thing that came to me is to do the job as well as I could. 
were the recipients of these sums made aware that the distribution of these sums were to be secret. I don't think I understand, understand the question, Senator. Did Mr. Bittman know that your delivery of the $25,000 to him was a secret delivery? Well, he knew the, that he was to come down and pick it up, that I didn't want to confront him, yes. Do you think Mr. Bittman declared the $25,000 in his income tax return? I have no knowledge. I, I do recall in one conversation where he mentioned it went into a night depository, uh, whether that's a record or so, I don't know. Did you at any time tell any of your recipients to keep this money secret? No, sir. What do you mean by under the table money? Uh, this was a, a phrase that was used uh, by uh, Mrs. Hunt, explaining why that uh, money was necessary in Florida. And it was not, I had asked her at one time at Mr. Kambach's direction, and she uh, alluded to the fact that it might have been for other people, other persons whom have not been mentioned to me by name. In your 27 years as a police officer, I'm certain you've heard the phrase under the table, which usually means a payoff, a cum shaw. Whatever it is, is illegal, isn't it? I think the circumstances would determine that, Senator. I, I am not a lawyer. I, I'm not uh, backing off on the fact that I'm a, I, I was you a You mean to officer. tell me if one of your colleagues told you that Mr. So-and-so is receiving money under the table, all you do is get a little suspicious? Won't, well, won't the, the context, bell start ringing no, here? No, not yet. Uh, I would make an investigation of that allegation, and in this case, I still have in mind that it's legal fees and that what she is suggesting and apparently didn't want to give me names of other individuals or something. That's the conclusion what we came to, that, that what she is doing is, is actually passing the money on to someone other than the name she had given me. And now that you look back to all of the activities, as we've asked most of our witnesses to look back in retrospect, do you still consider that the activities in which you were involved were completely legal? Yes, sir. Even if the payment was for hush money? Well, the term hush money was uh, is developed by, uh, by others. Uh, at the time, as I described, it was strictly for the legal defenses, Senator, plus assistance to the families. Uh, reiterated to me several times in the room. And do I, you I, still I, believe this to be true? Do I believe it? At that time, yes. Not I today, believe, right I now. I believe that when Mr. Comeback and I set out for this thing, that that's all was in our minds and in mine. He had me fully convinced of it. I don't question you on that, but today, do you believe that to be true? Uh, not likely. I thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, going back to the uh, beginning, Mr. Elasowitz, of your testimony. Uh, did you ever determine who this Mr. Caddy was? I had read in the papers that he was he was an attorney, uh, and that uh, I believe that he was he was the uh, attorney who was to be notified uh, when when uh, if some of the uh, somebody uh, that he had been were assigned as an attorney in case somebody got in trouble. Was that his real name? Oh, I believe so. But he never identified himself to you, what his profession was or who he was? He said, oh, he, uh, when I spoke to him, he, he did, uh, he was an attorney, I assume, or at least a, in some capacity, because he, he said that in our, our final conversation that he was sitting with somebody from the law firm, and he's telling me now that uh, he doesn't want to go any further with this, and I so reported. But he uh, did not indicate in his conversations with you that he knew anything about what you were talking about. Is that right? Or did he? I would say that's fairly correct, Senator, yes. Let's go back again to the <clears throat> very beginning of this scenario. Your first conversation with Mr. Comback, as you undoubtedly know, this is extremely important to determine whether his activities and your activities were lawful or unlawful. Now, what did he say when he contacted you about what he wanted you to do? 
in the hotel room. He told me that he had received an assignment. Well, before that, though. Oh, a telephone call requesting that I come the next day to Washington, D.C. to meet with him. And why did he say he wanted you to come? Uh, he spoke of an assignment, an important assignment for me. Did he mention anything about what the assignment was? No, sir. Just important? Yes, sir. All right, continue now. You came to Washington. Uh, when the conversation started, uh, Mr. Comback impressed upon me that uh, the assignment uh, is legal, uh, that it was to uh, raise finances to us or to provide monies, not raise, to provide monies for attorney's fees and for members of families or persons who had gotten into trouble. He was uh, very nervous. He was uh, kind of unsteady in it. It was apparently he was he, he was a, didn't know how to present the thing any further, and he repeated it about three times, and at the point I said well, that... Well, why would he be nervous? Well, I don't understand. Well, I think it was something new to Mr. Comback as far as, or he wasn't didn't show in what direction it might take, or perhaps it was, uh, perhaps it might even be that uh, speaking to me about it for the first time, perhaps that there were different ends of the earth or something like that, I don't know. Well, you mentioned he said it was legal. How, how did that come up on, in the uh, conversation? Did you ask him I it was legal? He, I, I may have uh, asked him, but I think he uh, wanted to reassure me, and he said that, uh, and he come out with that statement. Did he say how he knew it was legal? No, but I, I did, uh, I did uh, receive the distinct impression that he had searched this thing thoroughly out in his mind or whatever manner that he would use. He was no. confident and very, very sure. No question, though, that he did mention to you what this money was to be delivered for. Is that right? Yes, sir. And that was what? Watergate people. And in connection for, with the people in the Watergate incident. And for what purposes? For legal fees and assistance to their families. Now, let's go again to your first conversation with Mrs. Hunt. Uh, would you go into that again? I didn't see this witness sheet until this morning, and I've just heard your testimony here firsthand, and I'm not exactly sure that I understand what transpired. There were conversations about what she needed, is that right? That's correct, sir. Now, describe, describe again what, what she said to you. Well, in, in the initial conversation, she went into uh, uh, what sums of money uh, might be needed. Uh, and describe those carefully now right. to the committee. And, and what they might be needed for. Uh, and she went in, in the early conversation, as she mentioned herself, as uh, the fact that she would lose her, she was going to, she had been fired, she had lost a job, and that, that should be taken in consideration. And she with that, what she'd been doing? Uh, she was, I, I think it was, as I recall, she was a secretary or she was a, for some foreign embassy or something of that type. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go into that because this was, being our first contact, I immediately tried to inform her of my position in the matter, that I was simply to have gotten from her a figure for the script, etc. And definitely, per instructions from Mr. Comback, in no way was I to conduct any negotiations. Right, now, now, what was right. that figure? The first figure was yes. that I delivered to her was forty thousand. No, no, that she mentioned in this oh. first conversation. You know. uh, she went into. Uh, by the time she finished the conversation, it was probably around a hundred thousand dollars. And how was that broken down? That was broken down with uh, law fees, and I can't with the all the conversations. I kind of have to lump them in because of the sequence. The original I remember, but it always was with attorney fees, as I testified, and she'd mentioned an attorney and a defendant, and she'd mentioned the, the, trial, the, the difficulties of, uh, I was going to say trials and tribulations, I wasn't referring to a trial, of, uh, of how much money would be needed and bail money for the people down south and salaries for their living expenses, All and right. she would arrive at $3,000 a month for the principals, and then she went down a scale. Well, I, I understand that. That's what you testified at first. But what I'd like to find out is <clears throat> what is the breakdown of this figure of $100,000? That's the figure she first mentioned that no, she would she need. Didn't, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, she did not mention a figure of 100000 She never gave me a flat figure. All right. Well, what figures did she mention besides the $3,000 $3, per month for the leaders? <coughs> she would mention, and this is over... All the con over the conversations, I, I can't nail it down to the first one, but she would mention uh, 
money for in connection with Liddy's wife, her medical problems, the fact that being a school teacher. How much? Uh, 10,000, 15,000 per year. 10 or 15,000 for Mrs. Liddy's wife, is that right? Right. Same for him. I uh, rather for her, somewhere in that, her annual salary. 10 or 15 for Mrs. Hunt. And then the, uh, law, the uh, legal fees came into it. And how much were they for whom? Uh, they were, uh, they amounted to about $130,000 over a period of time. It's not in the one conversation. Well, in this first conversation, though, what, what the, you must have had a pretty vivid impression of that. After all, this was a unique assignment. Well, first Senator, time you're right. talking to Mrs. Hunt, and I, I'm trying to pin down now what you first gained from her as to what she wanted. Well, then I would, uh, I would guess that she brought up uh, Mr. Barker, Mr. Sturgis. Well, did, did she? You're, you're guessing now. Did she or didn't Well, she? it's very hard for me to, to uh, separate the amounts as per, for each conversation. But I know in the initial one, in addition to mentioning her own, she started when, and then she, it wasn't a demand, it was a request to consider hers in addition for attorney fees. The cost of the script, the attorney fees and all, she, uh, she went through the figures. Uh, she didn't come up constantly with a solid figure. Well, so far now, we've got $3,000 per month for living expenses for the leaders. Well, for... Ten or fifteen thousand dollars for Mrs. Liddy because she had psychiatric problems. Ten or fifteen thousand dollars for Mrs. Hunt because she needed that. That's the only figures we have yet. Now, what are the others? Uh, Mr. Barker... How much? Uh, ...would be... Uh, Six thousand dollars for what? Legal fees? For uh, no, that would be for living expenses. For a year? Or wh how long? Uh, for uh, one minute. Let me see if I have this. It would be for the three thousand. All these started as a per monthly basis, in which later on, or uh, probably the sub subsequent conversation, a multiple of five was used as suggested. Well, are you saying that Barker was five hundred dollars a month then? Is no, it was uh, it totaled to uh, uh, fifteen thousand. It was a request uh, for Barker was at two thousand. Sturgis Gonzalez two thousand. Oh, now, now, now wait a minute. You you said six thousand dollars for Barker a moment ago. For now, Barker, yes, sir. Now it's two thousand. No, it's six thousand dollars for Barker. Yes, it's four thousand for Sturgis. All right. Go on. And 2000 each for Gonzalez and Martinez. Now, these were living expenses over what period of time? Over a, uh, a five-month period. All right. Why five months? In a conversation, she spoke of a, of a rounded-out figure, and she brought up the, uh, the multiple of five. In other words, she asked, she, she asked for a five-month, would it be considered over a living expenses over a five-month period I of time? I see. Now, was this in the first conversation? I, I don't think all of it might have been in the first conversation, but it, it would be relative to the following conversation because the way the money was delivered, we couldn't meet these uh, requests. There just wasn't that much money. May I inquire what you're looking at there at the table? I'm looking at a sheet I wrote. Uh, after I had testified, as a reminder, when I first testified, I had the principal figures in mind. What I started with, when I memorized this thing, and I had mentioned that, uh, I started with the top figure of 219,000. Then I started with the four that were delivered to me, which came to 419. And then I, 219. Then I got into the delivery amounts, the four delivery amounts, so that I would retain that in my memory. This was a sheet you made for your first witness interview? No, it was made after the after my appearances, uh, even after the last appearance here. I see. Did you ever keep any notes when you had your conversations with any of these people? No, sir. No notes at all? No, sir. Ever? Okay. Well, now, let's go on. We have, yeah. so far, uh, the living expenses for these people. Uh, what about Hunt and Liddy? Now, did he have any living expenses, a McCord? Uh, yes, Mrs. Uh, uh, they were in the, uh, that's the $15,000 range, was uh, McCord, Liddy, and Hunt. 
Well, uh, I understood that you said that that was for Mrs. Liddy and Mrs. Hahn. No, Mrs. Liddy and Mrs. Mrs. Liddy was for the loss of her job, that oh. she associated a loss, and that was about $15,000 a year. For her? For her. All right. Well, and, that's the figure I have here. And for, for, Mrs., for uh, the school teacher was about, Mrs. Liddy was about 10, Mrs. Hunt 15. Uh, no. That was her request. Well, now, wait a minute. You, you just said Mrs. Liddy 15. Now you say 10. No, no. Mrs. Hunt was about, uh, requested a $15,000 figure. All right. And Mrs. Mrs. Liddy, a $10,000 All figure. right. Now, how about Mr. Hunt? How much for him? Mr. Hunt was $15,000. These are for living expenses. For living expenses. How about Liddy? $15,000. How about McCord? $15,000. Now, how about the attorney's fees? Uh, for Hunt, twenty-five thousand. All right. For McCord, twenty-five thousand. For Liddy, twenty-five thousand. Barker's attorney, twenty-five thousand. All right. And the three others, thirty thousand. Together. That, that, together, ten thousand each. Now, when did she mention these figures? Did she mention all of this the first time she talked to you? No, sir. Uh, when did she mention this? Over what period of time and how many conversations? In about uh, four or five conversations from uh, June, uh, from July to uh, August, in, in about a six-week period when these drops were made off. Can you give us any idea of the escalation of these demands? What she asked the first time, second time, third time, and so on? Well, they, they, they increased each time I called. She would... She would uh, increase the amount or request that more money would be needed for one reason or another. Well, can you give us... Uh, uh, when, and when she started initially, when she gave, uh, and I cut her off because of saying I'm not in a position to negotiate, etc., uh, she would repeat the demands each time. Some of them were repeated. Mm -hmm. And our problem was that we couldn't break it when we delivered the money. So the best that Mr. Comback and whoever he was speaking with said, well, deliver 40. And I guess there was to raise more and deliver the other. And when the second delivery was made, there were no directions as how she was to use the money. It was simply given to her to use as to satisfy because she could not pay all these amounts with the little with the amounts that she was getting. Did she ever mention any flat figure at any time for the overall affair? No, sir. Only bits and pieces from time to time. That's correct, sir. All right, now, now then, I'd like to go to, to the instructions as to what you told her, what to do with each amount of money you gave her. Would you please describe that in detail to the committee? Let's go to the first one. The 40000 Yes, is that the first amount you gave her? Yeah, and there, when she received the money... First drop to her was forty thousand dollars. Right, sir. All right. And, now, and there were with the drops, there were no discussions from me to her as to how to to spend it, how to dole it out, because in Congress, my instructions from Mr. Comback, it reached a point that what she was asking for was not in my possession. But what and, about on the very first drop? Did you tell her what to do with the money, the forty thousand dollars? The first drop, I believe, uh, was said to spread it out with, for the needs of the families to use the money first for the needs of the families. And did, that uh, other requests for attorneys, etc. Did, did you be... tell her how to break it down at all or just say this is for so. families? That's correct. I, uh, I relayed whatever instructions I'd received. Did she say anything to that in reply? Well, she was not satisfied. She said we, this, that there will be problems and she'll do her best. And I said, well, I understand that I will be getting back to you. Did she mention the fact that this sum is too small, we need more, and give you any figure? She, no, she didn't go in another. Uh, she would continue or reiterate what she had been giving me. We need, well, you know, the I lawyer's see. fees and so forth. All right, how about the second drop of $43,000? What did you tell her to do with that money? I believe that one, she had uh, already been told probably that she will get the money and she will distribute it in whatever manner comes to her. You gave her no instructions? No instructions. What about the uh, next drop of eighteen thousand uh, dollars? I don't believe any instructions with that. And the last drop of fifty-three thousand five hundred dollars? There were none on that one. In other words, the only thing you can recall then is is a discussion or an instruction on the first drop to use this money for the families. 
Yes, sir, and uh, to the best of my recollection. Again, I'd like to get back to this uh, under-the-table business, $10,000 to Barker. You discussed it with Senator Inouye. Uh, wh what did uh, she say to you when she described this and what it was to be used for? She said that uh, in addition to the other demands, there was $10,000 necessary to give to Barker for use under the table. That was in, in, the, in the early conversation. I recall that when it came back from Mr. Kambach. Well, well now, when, when this occurred, did you say, now, hold on here, Mrs. Hunt, what's this under the table business? I, I had asked what, uh, can you, more specific or something to that effect. She says, well, I think if you relay it that way, it'll be understood. And it was not understood, because I remember in a subsequent conversation asking her, and been asked by Mr. Comeback, what's the under the table? And she, in either second or third, somewhere along the line, she insinuated that it was for some other persons who were involved in this situation or may have been involved. Somebody in Florida. There was no further discussion as to what under the table was for. No, I was told not to discuss it any further. You never asked her what she was going to do with it? No, sir. This uh, $25,000 to Mr. Bittman, as I recall, that was the only payment you made to any of the attorneys directly. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Well, now, this is a rather unique way of paying an attorney's fee, is it not? Yes, sir, it's a, it's a way. Did Mr. Bittman express any surprise at this method of getting his fee? Oh, yes, in the initial conversation, he probably uh, uh, said something uh, that it was unusual, and uh, I said, well, however, uh, those are my instructions, and, uh, and then I made a call and relayed his message, and I was told, no, you, you, it'll, be, it'll be accepted. And when I called back, Mr. Bittman agreed to take it. Well, would you go into that a little further, the discussion about uh, how his figure came up and how this attorney's fee was going to be paid? When I spoke to uh, Mr. Bittman, he told me that it was the first conversations, that it was an unusual uh, manner to discuss lawyers' fees, uh, that you don't know about uh, how much expenses will be entailed. And uh, he started to go into uh, appeals that uh, could come in. And, and I said, well, I, I have no knowledge of this. I am told that you would have a figure, and I am prepared to deliver that figure. I was thinking in terms of the 75,100, which I had brought with me. And what did he say to that when you asked him or said to him, I was told you were going to name a figure? Uh, he said, well, uh, he said, no, he said, uh, uh, let me, something to the effect, let me get back or get back to me. And I relayed the message to Mr. Comeback. And after a period he of time. Said, he said, get back to him later? Yeah, he said to discuss it. Or he indicated something that uh, he was not taking it at that time. He was not going to accept the money in that manner at that time. Mm -hmm. He did name the figure of 25000 Finally, he named the $25,000 figure in our last conversation. Next well, to last now, now why, why didn't he want to get into the business of, of taking it or arranging for the taking it of that time? He was perfectly willing to negotiate the fee with you. Is that correct? Well, he didn't negotiate it with me, and I think that's the answer to the first question. Well, he, he had to get back and negotiate a fee with either his client or somebody else. And then he accepted. Then he gave me the figure. I think he negotiated with his client. Or, well, you say he negotiated with his client and gave you the figure. You mean in another phone conversation? In whatever manner that they were, uh, were dealing he, with his client, I don't know. Well, now, let's go back here. You, you called him on the phone. And the yes, sir. purpose of your calling him on the phone was to find out what he wanted for a fee. Isn't that right? That's correct. But it wasn't, it, yeah, it was uh, the cost of a script, of course, which it was a subterfuge. And he didn't come up with a number. At all. He didn't come up with a figure. I so reported to Mr. Comeback. Mm -hmm. Mr. Comeback says, all right, I'll get back to you. He got back and he says, call him again. Mm -hmm. Now, this might be a day or it might be an hour. I don't recall which. I, would, I called Mr. Bittman back and uh, he would start in that conversation. And, well, you know, a, a flat fee is a very unusual thing and all. And I said, well, I, I have no control over that. I am prepared 
for a figure for the cost of a script, and I would repeat the whole thing. And he says, well, he said, all right, let's, uh, he says, can you get back to me? I, I says, all right, and I reported that to Mr. Combine. Now, this is the second conversation? Second conversation. I think I had four conversations or five with Mr. Bittman. And then finally, uh, he mentioned it, that he would accept the money. Twenty, and he gave me the figure of twenty-five thousand. Finally, on the fourth conversation, he mentions a count. figure. Correct, sir. And he hasn't mentioned any figure before that. No, sir. All this other business is horsing around. Yes, sir. Why? I think he had to straighten it out with his client or with somebody. It's the only thing I can assume. All right. Now we arrive at a figure of twenty-five thousand. Then what happened? Uh, I uh, placed the twenty-five thousand in an envelope. Well, but hold on. Oh, I reported the combat. I reported the figure to combat. I was right. never to, my instructions were I was never to give anything until finally I reported and got the okay of Mr. Combat. I reported Mr. Combat. He got back to me and said, okay, deliver the money. Now, incidentally, in these phone calls with Mr. Combat, while you're, <clears throat> uh, I won't use the word negotiating, talking to Mr. Bittman on the phone. What's his reaction about all this uh, time uh, spent in phone conversations with Bitten? No, no particular reaction. It was, uh, I think it was agreeable to him. Or he, he was trying to make his mind up as to what kind of a fee. Did, was he calling anybody about this, do you know? Oh, I assume he was, yes, sir. Did he tell you? No, sir. All right, now we get to uh, how it's going to be paid. Would you describe that? Yes, the, uh, the manner of payment was that... Uh, I placed $25,000 in a brown class envelope. Well, I know that, but oh. let's go back a little and catch this. You arrive at the figure, and now that that big hurdle is over, you must have told Mr. Bittman something about how we're going to make this transaction. I told him I would get back to him because okay. I, had to, I had to call Mr. Comback and clear this that the figure was 25, and Mr. Comback said, I'll get back to you. All right. And then he, when he got back to me, he said, go ahead and deliver the money. All right. Now, now go on. I called Mr. Bittman. He was in his office, and uh, I said that I am willing to, I am all set now for the give, to uh, have the I have the money ready for him. And I outlined the procedure that if he'd come right down, it would be on the shelf. And he came down off the elevator, or a person came down. Well, off I, the I, elevator. I heard that, and of course we yeah. don't want to waste the time to go yeah. into that again. What I am interested in is is when you described to him how you was going to, how you were going to pay this fee. What, what did he say anyway? Didn't say anything. Didn't say anything? No, sir. He, he said, okay. You think he expected this in a brown envelope in a phone booth? I don't know. He, may, he probably knew that it would be delivered uh, in cash to him and, uh, in some manner where uh, whatever negotiations they were having. He didn't say, come to my office and pay me the fee or anything like that? No, sir. And when you suggested it would be paid this way, there was no evidence of any surprise at all? No, sir. It was on the telephone. I didn't get any in. Oh, I am reminded there was one. He did call me the next day. I received a call from Mr. Comback the next day to call Mr. Bittman. And I called Mr. Bittman, and he said he'd like to return the money. Oh, well, tell us about this. And uh, I called Mr. Comback and mentioned that to him, and he said, I'll get back to you. Called me back, he says, call Mr. Bittman again. And when I called Mr. Bittman back, he said, well, that's of no consequence now because it went in a night depository. Because I what? It went into a night depository, a night box in a bank. So it was no longer retrievable. No longer retrievable. Well, let, let's go over that again. Who, who told you he wanted to return the money? Mr. Bittman, after he had taken the $25,000. And, and when Mr. did this Combat, Mr. Combat asked me to call Mr. Bittman back the next this is day. The next day? Yes, sir. And, and, I and called describe Mr. this conversation again now. I called Mr. Bittman back, and he said that uh, he was considering he would like to return the money. Why? Did he mention any reason? He did not. Did you ask him? No, I was a little surprised at it. And I said, well, uh, let me check into it. I, would, I didn't make any indication that I was going to take the money back either. And then I called you Mr. You mean Combat. the substance of this conversation was uh, he, he, you call him and he said, yes. I, I want to return this money. He says, I, I would like to return the money, or words to that effect, that after speaking to his, his other attorneys or whatever it might have been, I don't quite recall, he's, but the gist of it is he wanted to return the money. Did he mention he'd talked to his law partners about it? 
He may have. I'm not certain. And you said, uh, hold on, uh, I've got to get instructions, is that it? Yes, sir. And that was the end of the conversation? That was it. How long did this conversation take? Very short period of time. And neither one of you expressed surprise? Well, I did. I was quite surprised. Well, what, I, what did you say? I said, well, I said, I, I don't understand. Is there uh, or something of that type? Uh, I said, I'll have to, uh, I will have to uh, get further instructions. Well, go on now. You... And I called Mr. Comback and reported the conversation to him. And when he got back to me, it was to call Mr. Bittman again, and, and I did. And at this point, Mr. Bittman said, well, it's okay. He said, the money, there's no question here now. The money was, there's no problem. The money was deposited in the, in a, uh, in the night box. Well, the now, box. this phone conversation, when you got back to him after you talked to Mr. Comback, how long was that after your previous phone conversation? I'd say Mr. a few Bittman? hours. Just a few hours? I would say so, yes, sir. Well, now, that must, I must say, that doesn't make much sense to me. He calls you and tells you he wants to return the 25000 A few hours later, you call him back, and he says there's no problems in a night box. Was no, that, he said this? that he had, he had, that the money had been deposited into a night depository, so that returning the money was no, no, uh, and that he was going to, alleging he was going to, or s inferring that he was going to handle this with his, uh, with his uh, client. What time of day do these calls occur? In the afternoon. Both calls? No, the, uh, uh, the money, the day that the, uh, yes, both calls would have been in the afternoon. The second call might have been in the morning. The second call, no, no. I the one after, the one in which he wants to return the money. Might have been in the morning. Yes, sir. And then the call that he said, no, don't bother, it's in a night box, occurred in the afternoon. Well, did you ask him uh, anything further? What changed his mind? No, sir. Did you express surprise to him at this change of horses? Yeah, I think so. I think I showed some surprise, and I said I'd have to get instructions. That I, uh... A couple of quick questions here. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Hunt made one pickup. That was the only one, was it not? Yes, sir. How did you know who he was? I didn't. But it, I on. did not. How did you know that he, Mr. Hunt was picking up the money? When his wife told me that because of some personal problem that day, that she wouldn't, this was the second or third pickup, that she wouldn't make it, and that her husband would make the pickup. And I said, well, you will explain all the details to him. She says, oh, he'll do exactly as the instructions have been going. And then he came in, looked at the clock, and followed the whole procedure perfectly. Do you have any way of identifying other than his knowing where to go? No, sir. That satisfied me. Yeah. What about Mr. Liddy? Now, you made one payment to him. Did you know who he was? Yes, I knew uh, that he was one of the defendants. His name came up with... All but, I mean, how did you recognize him as the man... He told me that he's going to come in a shirt, roll up sleeves, and he was going to obey the instructions. I, I'm curious about one one thing here. You mentioned that Caulfield was one of those Washington holes in the sieve, I guess. Well, what does that mean? Well, the, 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 the thing in this was the confidential, everything would be kept strictly confidential. And, of course, uh, I had agreed with Mr. Comback it would so be that I would tell no one. And when I was put to a question here, I, I didn't give it to Mr. Caulfield or anybody else. Well, I mean, what, what, what's a hole in the sieve mean? Well, there are many leaks and uh, very few secrets in Washington in time. But wasn't he a pretty good friend of yours? Didn't you trust sure him? Sure was. Did you I... think he was like all the other Washingtonians? Oh, yes, sir. Sort of a disease once you get here? I think it? once you're caught here, you're caught. <laughs> <laughs> and there ain't no way out. <laughs> How about you? Did you get contaminated with Washington? Including you, almost. I think that I'm not contaminated in any way because I know anything I did, I did it uh, uh, seeking to do it. I wanted to. I went with my eyes wide open, and I think I did a good job. <laughs> well, just one final question. Uh, when did you begin getting suspicious about this train of events that you were caught up in? I would say with the second call of Mrs. Hunt. And why? 
because of the demands, the continuous adding of money, the urgency, where a first conversation is uh, one of, uh, not of demand, when, when she first started it was a request, and then it became to change its shape. And when are we going to get this? And, and now, uh, while we started with 75,100 to go to, a, to a person face to face, now the whole system changes. We're into this way of distribution money, of the distributions of the money, plus newspaper publicity, etc. But basically, in this particular matter, the, the manner in which she was putting, increasing everything, and uh, it became obvious that it was a much larger thing than, than the original uh, request. I had agreed to a 75,100 distribution which the, with Mr. Comback, and he had probably, and I'm sure, had been of the same mind. Now we're into something that after about two calls, we're somewhere into $400,000, and we still can't figure it out. Did, did you ever discuss that with her, why these demands were always increasing and, to you at least, always excessive? No, sir. That's all. Thank you. Sir, tell me. Now that Senator Gurney has satisfied his curiosity, we're going to pause briefly. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, Correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the caucus room, Senator Talmadge is asking the questions. Thank you. Senator Talmadge. Senator Talmadge. Mr. Lesowitz, are you still on the payroll? No, sir. When did your association with Mr. Comback cease? Uh, the, uh, 19, the end of 1972. End of 1972? Yes, sir. What are you doing now? Retired? Semi-retired. Living in the city of New York? Uh, living in the uh, in the town of Day in uh, Saratoga County in New York State. Are you working at the present time? No, sir. Now, when you got suspicious that this distribution of money ceased to be a humanitarian effort and became a blackmail program, why didn't you withdraw from it at that time, Mr. Ulysses? At the earliest opportunity, I withdrew. I told Mr. Comback that... I thought you made some three drops thereafter, did you not? No, one one drop. Uh, when did they start haggling about money and saying that wasn't enough? I would say uh, the second or third uh, uh, pre-drop to Mrs. Hunt is when she started raising it and began more of a, a demanding fashion. And I so reported my opinion to Mr. Comback. You uh, made either one or two more drops thereafter, yes, did sir. you not? And then you retired from the field? Yes, sir. You thought perhaps at that point you'd been used by friends, I take it, didn't you? Well, I don't think friends would want to use me, but uh, the situation was such that uh, I was picking up a lot of friends after this Watergate thing happened at, uh, for requests. You felt you had been used, I take it. All right, sir. Is that an affirmative answer? Yes, sir. Uh, you never made any determination as to the amount of money that would be paid to these individuals personally. You were courier and delivered it, and that's all. Yes, sir. Who made the determination as to the specific amount that would be delivered? No, sir. Who did? Oh, who did? Yes. I, I don't know, sir. You were never informed about that fact? No, sir. Did you have any dealings with anyone else except Mr. Comback in delivering this money? No, sir. No conversations of any kind of character? No, sir. You didn't know where Mr. Comback was getting his authority or his orders to make the delivery? No, sir. Did you have any assumptions as to where it was coming from? Uh, yes. Well, who did you I think? believe that they were uh, somebody that uh, in a uh, position uh, that would be equal or higher than Mr. Comback's. Who did you think that individual was? I, uh, I guess I assumed it would be someone that, uh, like Ehrlichman or Holderman. You thought they were well, arguing that time. Yes. And made the arrangements, and that you and Mr. Comback were merely carrying out their orders and instructions. Is that correct? All right, sir. Now, I believe when the plane crashed, 
unfortunately killed Mrs. Hunt, there was a considerable sum of money on her person at that time, was there not? Uh, I read in the papers $10,000. You don't have any idea what that particular sum was for? No, sir. Whether or not she was delivering it or whether it's her own personal funds that you had previously delivered to her? I have no knowledge of that 10000 Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Senator Baker. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Blasowitz, I can't resist saying that you provided us all with at least a half a dozen titles for books or novels. Well, that Mr. was Blasowitz. not my intent, Senator. It was just Mr. to Blasowitz present it as a you know, the, uh, the whole thing. I will pay for it, that's for sure. Yeah. The newspapers will have a ball with this one. <laughs> who thought you up? I mean, who, who, who put <laughs> Well, I don't know, but they, they taught me to, maybe my parents' fault. Yeah, well. Right. <laughs> There's an element of intent there. I'm not sure I'll impute to your parents. But what I really mean is, who first employed you? Where did, where, where did the first contact come from? Was it with uh, Comback? Or was it with Dean, or was it with someone else in the CRP or the White House group? It would be uh, Mr. Caulfield. Did you ever do any work for Caulfield? Before taking the assignment? Any time. No. Oh, yeah, after I received my assignments uh, from Mr. Caulfield. Not this one, though? No, sir. Did you ever work for Mr. Kalmbach before? I had no other assignments with Mr. Kalmbach. Did you ever work for Mr. Ehrlichman? I had no assignments for Mr. Ehrlichman. Mr. Baldwin? No, sir. Anybody else at the White House or CRP? Uh, the only one in the White House that relayed or gave me an assignment is Mr. Caulfield. I'm not talking now just about the Watergate. I'm talking about anything else. Anything. I'm, no other duties, no other intelligence activity or investigative work of the type? The only one that assigned the work to me, is, if I understand the question, Senator, was Mr. Caulfield. But, and I hope not unnecessarily redundant, you are telling me that you never received any instructions on Watergate or anything else uh, from Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Dean, Mr. Kalmbach, except that which you've described. Correct, sir. Did you ever conduct any investigative work for the White House or for CRP uh, uh, at some time other than this uh, Watergate situation? No, sir. Uh, there were uh, there were a series of investigations, Senator, that I was assigned, given the assignment by Mr. Caulfield, from whom he received the assignments back of him. I have no knowledge, or well, to whom I'm, the results went to. I have no knowledge. What I'm trying to establish now is whether or not anyone else, other than Mr. Caulfield, gave you instructions, or gave you advice, or suggested a scope of other inquiries other than the Watergate affair. Best of my recollection is no, sir. But there were other inquiries, investigations. Yes. And Mr. Caulfield gave your instructions in, the, in that respect. Yes, sir. Did you ever know McCord before this happened? No, sir. Did you ever know Liddy before it happened? No, sir, before the water game. Oh, I met him once under a different name for a few minutes. Yes, sir. <laughs> I did. McCord? Not McCord. Liddy. 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 What other name? Uh, Mr. George. He was introduced to me as Mr. George, and he was, took an accounting of, uh, as a finance, uh, I was told he was a finance uh, in a committee, the committee to reelect, I guess it would be, and then he checked my, uh, uh, my uh, list of expenses. Where was this done? This was done in uh, New York City in, in a, in a uh, uh, an apartment in which I had rented with the, uh, to establish a, uh, an agency of my own, a private detective agency. And he introduced himself as Mr. or identified himself as Mr. Mr. George. Mr. George. Did he then hold the position of general counsel to the committee to reelect the president, or do you know, or have you since learned? I don't know. I was told that he was in the uh, counsel in the uh, finance division of that organization. 
Have any idea why he introduced himself as Mr. George instead of I Mr. Williams? I have no Williams? idea. Do you know who was responsible for you being hired? Who was responsible? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really referring you back right, to Mr. Caulfield. To previous Mr. Caulfield, right. Well, I, I have and some... And then a conversation with Mr. Ehrlichman and a conversation with Mr. Combank. According to my information here, the transcript of your previous testimony on page 702, which we'll supply you if you'd like a copy, indicates that it was your thought that Mr. Ehrlichman was responsible for you being originally hired at the White House. Yes, he interviewed me as to the, uh, for the position. Right. But the original contact for me to take this assignment came from Mr. Caulfield. In order, he, Mr. Corpio was not in a position to hire me yeah. or pay my salary. Subsequently, a meeting was arranged where I would be interviewed about the job by Mr. Ehrlichman. And that, in fact, happened. That happened. And following that, uh, the acceptance of me, I had to be, I was interviewed by Mr. Comback in order to send, uh, to uh, set up my pay and so forth. Yeah. Did Ehrlichman describe to you the type of your probable assignments if you were, in fact, hired? Uh, it was only uh, a conversation uh, included uh, regarding my work, confidential investigations that might come from time to time of any type and that it was on a trial basis to see how it would work out. Well, surely he described to you what he meant by confidential yes, sir. investigations. He mentioned that there would be some of, uh, some, uh, uh, some would be political figures of uh, Republican or any other party, a Democratic party. There would be uh, backgrounds on persons who maybe uh, want to become vis uh, visitors to, persons who may be sought uh, for appointment uh, to jobs, uh, positions within the government, uh, types of investigations that they might not want the, um, a, a public, uh, uh, say, a, a agent of the Bureau or a Secret Service or somebody of that type, uh, because a record would be made and they want to may have a background on such a person. Uh, and I, I would say that's about the general... Uh, uh, theme of that conversation. Well, that's a whole lot. You've told us everything. Well, he didn't actually go into all that, but uh, yeah, well, that's what it meant to me. Did he name names of people that he wanted to look in, or wanted to investigate? Or no, sir. Did you later undertake such investigation? Yes, sir. Can you tell us of whom and about what? Let me let me say this, Mr. Chairman. It's my understanding that. Mr. Ulasiewicz will once again return for further testimony, another ca uh, category of testimony. So that's correct. We'll abbreviate this inquiry at this point with the full understanding that we can pursue that aspect of it later, Mr. Ulasiewicz. But back on the matter of who hired you and for what purpose, uh, it is your clear understanding Mr. Erlingman was the one who finally passed on your employment. Correct, sir. Was it also your impression that Mr. Ehrlichman was the one who set and directed your assignment and responsibilities and that Mr. Caulfield simply carried out those instructions or that Mr. Caulfield chose your assignments and responsibilities? I would say both, that Mr. Ehrlichman would give some assignments and possibly other people in the White House to Mr. Caulfield and probably to me. Do you know where Mr. Caulfield worked? He worked in the, uh, I think they call it the executive office building at the White House. You know who he worked for in the chain of command. Did he work for Mr. Dean? I or? became familiar at a point in time that one of his superiors was Mr. Dean. But in any superior. event, for our purposes and the purposes right. of the record at this time, Ehrlichman was the final authority on your employment. Yes, sir. He described to you in a general way your responsibilities. Both Ehrlichman and Caulfield gave you assignments from time to time. You're under the impression that Ehrlichman was the final authority in this respect, and you went forward with those projects. Yes, sir. That's true. Except that Mr. Ehrlichman never gave me an assignment personally. Well, did you gain knowledge of certain assignments that were initiated by Mr. Ehrlichman? Did Mr. Caulfield tell you about it? For no, he never related to me from whom the assignments would come in the White House. I see. All right. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if I might, address a comment to the uh, senator from Tennessee uh, in order that uh, we understand each other on a matter which uh, he raised with the witness. Uh, 
I wish, if he intends, uh, or, or if he intended, that he would pursue his line of questioning. Because if he does not pursue his line of questioning, I intend to pursue his line of questioning, and I think I ought to make that known to the senator from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I know exactly what Senator Weicker is talking about, and I certainly have no objection to any member of the committee pursuing that line of questioning at this time. But we've tried, and this is what I had in mind when I made the remark I did, we've tried in these hearings with only matter of success to compartmentalize the areas of inquiry and to Watergate and the cover-up, the so-called money, the so-called dirty tricks and the like. And we're getting into another category of inquiry, and just for the sake of orderliness, I plan to postpone that. Now, I have a rather extensive memorandum on it here, but I, for my part, will defer that until we call Mr. Ulaswitz back. Obviously, Senator Weicker, I have no objection whatever if you wish to pursue it at this time i'll be glad to give you my memo if you want to uh, i'd only say this to the distinguished senator from tennessee that i think it is it's, it's very much within this category to show that uh, the uh, actions taken by mr Ulasewicz in the case of the uh, payoffs was not a particularly unusual activity at all in relation to other assignments which he was given and um, uh, i'm aware that the senator from tennessee has uh, done considerable background work as uh, has the committee on this, and I didn't want in any way to uh, have you stopped, if you will, and go ahead and, and uh, when it came my turn to pick up the ball and run with it, because that's exactly what I intend to do, and I wish you'd pursue the line of questioning that you started. My, my distinguished chairman whispered in my ear, if we don't get along with this hearing, we'll still be at it when the last trembling tones of Gabriel's trumpet sounds the judgment. <laughs> Uh, the chair sincerely, the chair will not undertake to control any senator. The chair will express a sincere hope that we will confine our interrogation of the Mr. Ulysses at this time <laughs> to uh, the phase of involving the, the break-in and the, the alleged cover-up of the Watergate burglary. The, the Mr. The witness is the most intriguing witness, and the temptation <laughs> to uh, interrogate him uh, is uh, very strong. I am going to resist succumbing to the temptation, however, because I think he's been fully interrogated as to the matters uh, relating to the distribution of this money. And I think I know that the, wit that the committee has some other witnesses it needs to interrogate and who are awaiting interrogation. Oh, uh, Senator Montoya. Mr. Chairman, I only have two or three questions, and uh, <clears throat> I will not pursue the line of questioning, which has been the subject of the dialogue here. But I do want to say uh, or ask Mr. Losevich, again, I want to ask you, at what point did you feel seriously that uh, your activity might be subject to question as to its legality or propriety? I would say uh, about the uh, time of the second drop-off, second or third drop-off to Mrs. Hunt. Well, uh, you indicated in your testimony that uh, in your initial contacts, you had gone to Mr. Caddy and then to Mr. O'Brien for the purpose of uh, delivering attorney's fees to them and that they had turned you down. Yes, sir. Very curtly, very abruptly, you sought instructions from Mr. K or Mr. Combeck. Didn't this uh, trigger some kind of curiosity or concern in your mind that uh, what you were actually launching by way of an operation might uh, be something that uh, might be illegal when not these attorneys didn't want to have anything to do with it? Not at that time, sir. I, I uh, attributed to a snafu amongst their communications or contacts. Uh, did you discuss uh, your, any concern that you might have had with Mr. Combeck uh, when these two attorneys turned you down? Yes, sir. What, what, what did you discuss with Mr. Combeck? That the, the thing was not going as he had outlined, that it, uh, right from the start now we have a problem, that there is, uh, I am to make a delivery of $75,100 apparently to an attorney or to someone, 
And it, after three or four contacts, we have no one that's willing to go along with it. And that's when the education started. All right. Didn't the further fact that you were delivering this money in cash to these attorneys and the fact that they had turned you down uh, uh, compound uh, uh, the triggering of uh, possible concern on your part with respect to the nature of your activity? It did later on when the amounts grew. Uh, now, then subsequent to this, when you delivered the money to Mr. Bittman and... Uh, then he, in turn, wanted to return the money. Didn't that uh, fact also add to possible concern on your part as to the legality of your clandestine activity? Not, not to the legality. I still was of a mind that it, what I was doing was legal, but it did indicate to me that they were in some kind of a problem with their communications or... You've been a detective for a long time. Why did you not question the technique outlined to you for the delivery of this money? The leaving of the money in the boxes? Secretly and, and so forth. No, uh, the, the method of delivery was entirely my own. That was, that's, that was my own choice. And, uh, why, why did you choose uh, this method? Because Mr. Kambach had requested that I do this with utmost confidence without involving anyone, and this is after the caddy thing. Well, would, that, would it have been outside of the sphere of good discretion to just walk into a an attorney's office and just uh, deliver $25,000 rather than to leave it in a telephone booth? Yes, sir, but uh, Mr. Kambach uh, was paying me, and it's by his request uh, that I was following his instructions. Now, you, you performed other assignments for the White House, Yes, sir. Uh, under the direction of Mr. Caulfield? Yes, sir. Uh, how many assignments uh, would you say you performed uh, uh, during the course of 1971 for Mr. Caulfield? Nineteen seventy-one? Yes. I would, I would guess uh, 35, 30. I, I'm not certain at this time. I, I didn't break it down in that fashion. And how many assignments did you perform in the year 1972? Probably the same amount. And who were you paid by? Uh, Mr. Kambach. Why, if you were working for the White House, did, were you not paid uh, by the federal government? Initially, when I took the assignment, it was my request that uh, I uh, work for a law firm. It was my ambition to go with an attorney's firm for the simple reason that the job at most could have lasted till 72, which it did, and there was a possibility of much less time than that. And who agreed with you uh, as to that method of payment? Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Kambach. And what discussions did you have with him with respect to the arrangement whereby you would be paid by a law firm rather than by the government? I discussed with uh, Mr. Kambach the method of payment, the mailing of checks, etc. Well, wh why did you discuss it with Mr. Kalmbach, when you had previously discussed your employment with Mr. Ehrlichman, he had approved it. Yes, sir. And uh, did he send you to Mr. Kalmbach? Yes, sir. Well, when you no. went to Mr. Kalmbach, then uh, the choice was uh, no longer there for you to suggest that Mr. Kalmbach pay you, was it? No. When we initially entered the negotiations with Mr. Ehrlichman, it was stated as my desire that I be go on to a law firm, that I go with an, att an attorney's uh, firm. Well, didn't it sound strange to you that you were performing official functions for the government and for the White House and being paid by a private individual? I, I didn't consider myself working for the government. As a matter of fact, it was the one thing I wanted to avoid. I had just came to the police department, a government agency, and I, I wanted to go into the private sector. Well, weren't you, per <laughs> weren't you performing functions for Mr. Caulfield that were yes, official sir. in nature? and governmental in nature. No, I, I conducted confidential investigations of various types. Well, are you now saying to me that what you performed uh, for Mr. Caulfield was outside of the scope of government and not connected with any of the governmental functions of the White House? Would you explain the uh, question, please, Senator? I don't, I don't understand the question. Then, 
are you in effect telling me that the assignments which you conducted were not governmental in nature and not dealing with the White House? I don't think I understand what governmental in nature would be at this point. Well, don't you understand what uh, functions of government are? I conducted uh, uh, investigations relating to uh, whatever might have been assigned to me. I don't recall in my determination of governmental functions that they had to do with official government uh, agencies or... Uh, well, tell me the nature of those functions. We're not going to go into individuals, but tell me the nature of those functions. Background investigations of, uh, of persons possibly coming into the government or being contemplated uh, for appointment, uh, allegations of uh, various types of that nature that it could be construed that if someone was or persons coming into uh, that would write into the White House or uh, would write, uh, as I understood, might uh, communicate in some way and they wanted uh, that person's background check and didn't want it, uh, I would get the assignment. Then uh, wouldn't all those functions be uh, official in nature, dealing with uh, White House governmental operations? White House operations, yes, I believe so. All right. Then didn't uh, this trigger some concern or doubt in your mind as to why you were being assigned to a private payroll to perform these particular functions? It didn't mean, uh, it didn't make any difference to me. Uh, Did you ever ask anyone to not put you on a federal payroll, but to put you on a private payroll? Yes, sir. Who did you suggest this to? Uh, it's to Mr. Corbyn or Mr. Ehrlichman. Very strange. Very strange. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Subcommittee will stand in recess to two. I mean, the committee will stand in recess to two o'clock. I don't come back. During the luncheon recess, the senator settled that question of ground rules for questioning Mr. Ulasewicz, and Senator Weicker is about to pursue his limited inquiry into White House ordered investigations done by Mr. Ulasewicz. Mr. Yelasowitz, you testified this morning that as far as you're concerned, you never did anything illegal and you were not a party to any illegal activities, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Now, I'd like your comments on testimony which you gave on May the 23rd. On May the 23rd, Senator Inouye asked you the following questions, and you responded in the following manner. Senator Inouye, in this special assignment you undertook from Mr. Caulfield to serve as contact with Mr. McCord, were you aware you were being an accessory to the crime of obstructing a criminal investigation? Mr. Yelasowicz, yes, sir. I knew that it was wrong. Senator Inouye, you knew you were an accessory to a crime. Mr. Yelasowicz, yes, sir. Now would you like to comment or equate your testimony of May 23rd to what you stated before this committee today. Senator, excuse me, may you be current to the copy of that testimony, please? Yes, indeed. Yeah, that was correct. Yeah. Uh, Senator, where do I get the testimony? I would ask, uh, I would ask committee staff to supply Mr. Lasowitz and his counsel with a transcript. I've received one page. Mm -hmm. 
At the time that I took the action I did, the telephone call, I did not believe that I was committing any crime. Uh, a friend had asked me to make a phone call, assured me, etc., as I testified. It's later on, and uh, sub subsequently, uh, when I was interrogated and uh, so forth, that the allegation was brought to me, or the fact was brought to me, that it uh, might be construed as a, as, a, as a crime. But that wasn't your testimony, Mr. Yulasiewicz. Your testimony is very specific. I will repeat Senator Inouye's question. Yeah, I understand. In this special that, assignment, you undertook for Mr. Caulfield to serve as contact with Mr. McCord. Were you aware you were being an accessory to the crime of obstructing a criminal investigation, Mr. Ulasiewicz? Yes, sir. I knew, that's past tense, that it was wrong. Senator Inouye, you knew you were an accessory to a crime, Mr. Ulasiewicz? Yes, sir. Yes, at the time when I used it in the past tense, as I was speaking as uh, finding it out or coming to believe that it might have been a wrongdoing. Uh, and yet, in my mind today, as I sit here, I don't, I don't really consider myself ever committing a crime in that sense. So, I had no purpose. I was on no payroll. I had no intent of any kind. Would you like to then use this as an occasion to change your testimony of May the 23rd? No, just to explain it. Uh, just to explain it, yes. Now, in addition, Mr. Ulasiewicz, you've testified this morning that you wanted no further part in the activities regarding the Watergate defendants once you and Mr. Kambach had gotten out of the payoff activity. Now, if this is so, then why did you proceed to contact Mr. McCord at Mr. Caulfield's request in January of 1973 and, in fact, relate to Mr. McCord the following message, a year is a long time, no one knows how a judge will go, your family will be provided for, rehabilitation and job opportunities will be provided for. May I have a page, please? Again, here, uh, uh, I would ask the committee to go ahead and supply it. I, I have it. I have it, Senator. I, really I, do, not have, I do not have a page. You don't have a page? Wait a minute. I beg your pardon. This would be page 697. Thank you, sir. In connection with my uh, uh, answer uh, that uh, we were speaking of Watergate and the money drops and uh, this entire thing that I went through uh, in prior testimony. And uh, I was not, it, it, at that time, when I answered the question, it was not in my mind connected with this uh, telephone call. Would you then state before the committee then that uh, even once you uh, doubted the nature of your work, you still continued in that work. Is that correct? Only to the phone call. Only to the phone call. That is correct, sir. Now, Mr. Ulaswitz, as I indicated this morning, I intend to uh, ask you several questions relative to the other matters that were handled by you. It is not my intention uh, to go into specifics of each investigation, but rather to try and characterize your job. First off, I'd like to set, if I could, your status insofar as payroll, insofar as the White House is concerned. If I'm not mistaken, you were paid by Mr. Kambach's law firm. Is that correct? Correct, sir. You were paid a salary from May of 1969 to December of 1972. July. July, July of 1969. July of 1969. Is December 1972 correct? Uh, 1972 December would be correct. Yes, sir. You were paid $22,000 per year. Is that correct? That is correct. The last year was uh, $2,000 per month, was $24,000 in the final year. And uh, expenses, is that and correct? And expenses, yes, sir. Could you indicate to me uh, the amount of the expenses per year? Uh, roughly about $1,000 a month. 
So somewhere in the neighborhood of $12,000 per year in addition to the $22,000 salary. That is correct, sir. And this payroll was the payroll of Mr. Kambach's law firm. That is correct. And your instructions, with the exception of the monies that you discussed this morning relative to the uh, defendants, the Watergate defendants, your instructions came from Mr. Caulfield. That is correct. And you knew that Mr. Caulfield was in the White House? Yes, sir. So that, in effect, you were paid by Mr. Kambach, your instructions came from the White House? Correct, sir. Now, I'd like to, if I could, try and get into the general nature of the investigations, the other investigations which you conducted. Is it a fact that these investigations, or some of these investigations, were background checks on individuals intended to develop questionable facets of the personal lives of these individuals? That is correct, sir. Now, when we're talking about questionable facets, would this include sexual habits? Uh, these were allegations, and I'm that might be included in the category, yes, sir. That would be included in the category. Uh, drinking habits? Yes, sir. Uh, domestic problems? Yes, sir. Uh, personal social activities? Yes, sir. These background checks, is there any other, let me ask you the question, is there any other general category which you would assign to, to these background checks? Yeah, there would have been backgrounds on various uh, other individuals, uh, corporations, organizations, and, uh, and any allegation, and allegations concerning uh, uh, political figures. All right, I haven't gotten into asking you the question as to who you perform these checks on. I'm just trying to get the nature of the investigation. And I think we've checked off domestic problems, drinking habits, personal social activities, uh, 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 sexual habits. Is there any other, is there any other type of activity which uh, was investigated relative to any corporation or individual? No, it would depend on the allegation. It would depend the degree uh, of investigation. Uh, there wasn't a complete investigation on any one person with all those titles involved. Sometimes it was an allegation of, uh, of drinking or what it might be, and I might uh, just keep my investigation to that particular category. Now, can we categorize in a general way those individuals or corporations that were investigated by you? Were potential political opponents of the President so investigated? Yes, sir. Uh, were, were other political figures, aside from potential political opponents of the President, investigated? Probably, yes, sir. And were the individuals in, in this category, were they entirely um, background checks prior to employment? Or was it for some other reason? Some would be prior to employment, and some would be as a result of an allegation in a newspaper or something of that type. Did you ever file your investigations uh, in a written form? No, sir. Why not? Uh, when I took the assignment, uh, it was set up that I would report directly and verbally. I kept, uh, would keep no files. Did you at any time, did you at any time uh, conduct any electronic surveillance on any individual, either in the form of a bug or of a tap? No, sir. Were your investigations or were there investigations intended to develop lists of contributors to political candidates? Yes, sir. 
Now, how would you, what would be, how, how would you go at this problem? You're trying to develop a list of potential political contributors. Uh, what, well, do you, what do you investigate to, to, to develop a list? Well, in fact, it would, uh, the, the assignment would be given to me in a, in a manner that uh, to uh, uh, go into the lists of, uh, for instance, those at the file here in the Senate and to get the papers that they file concerning their contributors. Uh, I was never asked to go out and uh, list a, uh, as such, right from the start, for instance, get a list of contributors. I was told to go up to the Senate. I would be given Senate offices. I might be given a list of 10 or 12 senators and come back and uh, give them a listing of what, uh, if they had such thing, I would give the list of the people who contributed. In other instances, I might go to the state capitol and I go into a public office. I ask, are these public records and are they available? Available? They would give me, and they usually they're filed by the uh, by the candidate. In addition to that, I would consult the Times Index uh, for contributor lists, depending on the state and how much interest was pursued in the matter. So, actually, the development of these particular lists was done entirely from public records. Yes, sir. But now let's get back to the individuals that you investigated. How is it possible? How is it possible to get into matters of domestic problems and drinking habits and social activities and sexual activity through the matter of just the public record? Well, the uh, the allegation uh, would first cause uh, the incident would have to have occurred when I received the investigation. If it was an allegation of uh, of uh, some uh, a drinking allegation, we might take. Uh, I would then develop that lead by. Uh, uh, reading what the allegation was, uh, going into the area in the most discreet manner that I would know how, and I did so for several years, and I would develop whether it happened or not, and a very high percentage of these allegations were false. But I would develop my leads by uh, interviewing uh, bartenders, patrons, whatever time it may take, how long it, if it was hotel, hotel help, waiters, those type of people I were the most targeted. So in this particular instance, the information developed was not necessarily a matter of public record. That's right. Sir. It could have been a matter of personal interview. Correct. Sir. What other, uh, we've now got potential political contributors. We have potential political opponents of the president. We have other political types. What other types of individuals did you investigate? You know, and again, in the, in the category right. form. Without they might be, members, uh, might be members of the uh, of a political family. It might be uh, a son or a nephew or something of that type. Uh, perhaps an allegation of some possible misconduct, and I would go out on it and to see if whether or not it was true and uh, develop it and then return my, uh, give my report. And that would likewise be done by going into the area, possibly making my own observations, uh, interviewing people that uh, might be familiar with the uh, circumstances, the surroundings. I would determine uh, habits, etc. Or also, there are many, in many instances, another category where persons seeking, who would be uh, probably uh, seeking visits to the White House or uh, something of that type, and they might want to know it was a large group, as a, uh, they might want to know the political affiliations. That would be the registration records would be concerned, and I would go out and look at the public records for their registrations, what party registration there are prior to them coming in. All right, any other categories such as uh, groups or uh, oriented toward a particular philosophy or politics? In the outset of my investigations, early in the outset, when, they, when we uh, were going over the uh, problems with dissident groups within uh, the picketing here at the uh, White House, and relatively I had left from my experience in the police department, I might follow uh, up on that, but that gradually phased out. So in fact, Mr. Ulasiewicz, uh, uh, let me, let me ask you this. Is there anything else? I don't want to cut you off in any way here. Let me just ask the general question, either as to the type of individual or group being investigated by you or the nature of your investigation. Is there anything else that you feel you would like to tell to this committee at this time relative to this subject matter without, and I repeat, without getting into the specifics of the name? I think at, that, at this time, without going into uh, uh, f further uh, recollection, I think that you pretty well covered it, Senator, and uh, generally uh, groups and persons. So that, in fact, Mr. Ulasiewicz, the Watergate project 
which you discussed with this committee this morning, was just another in really a series of activities that could be termed surreptitious. Uh, it was another in a series of investigations, yes, sir. There wasn't anything that was particularly unusual about this activity compared to other ones that you had conducted. In a sense, then, when I received uh, an assignment from uh, a superior, from somebody, uh, a directive, I did it, yes. Well, as an ex-law enforcement official, didn't you feel that the normal agencies of law enforcement in this country were totally capable of uh, handling uh, any uh, matters that uh, affected the safety the well-being of the President of the United States? Oh, yes, sir, uh, undoubtedly, and uh, I did it myself for the... Uh, in, yes, sir. In other words, that the normal agencies could have accomplished that job without the activities that you conducted? Yes, sir. So your activities were not... could not be termed protective of the President of the United States, could they? No, sir. Would it be fair to say that you dealt in dirt at the direction of the White House? Allegations. Allegations of it, yes, sir. But the information, Mr. Yulasiewicz, and the activities conducted over this three-year period were not open, were they? I'm talking now about your activities. Oh, no. I conducted my, my uh, investigations in a most discreet and confidential manner that I know how. But the information which you solicited was not the type of information that you cared to write down, is that correct, or that should appear in public print? Well, I don't know if it did appear in public print, if, if that's uh, a... Uh... I didn't write it for the you, purposes of public I, print. I, I see. Right. In other words, what you, are, are you indicating to me that, that possibly uh, matters did come to the public attention that were based on your investigations? It's possible. I repeat my question. How would you categorize the information which you turned over to Mr. Caulfield? I would say it was... Uh, was it of a national security nature? No. no, sir. Domestic security nature? No, sir. Dirt? No, it would be a, a political of a political nature. Political, uh, political dirt. All right, sir. And, uh, and there were other assignments which were of a, a, a different nature, which uh, were not of that type. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. I just... Uh, I just thought it important that the entire job uh, that Mr. Lasowitz had be, be characterized. I suppose that uh, I, like many others, uh, uh, can't fault in any way uh, what is a wonderful sense of humor, Mr. Lasowitz. But I must confess that a long time ago, I lost my sense of humor on the activities uh, that you've described here today. Uh, I tell my friends, as a matter of fact, that uh, it seems that today's Watergate joke becomes tomorrow's testimony. And uh, I would only ask you this question to try and appropriately frame the description which you gave to me. You know where Mr. Liddy is right now? Yes, sir. Where? He's in prison. Mr. Hunt? He's in prison. Mrs. Hunt? She's dead. Mr. Barker? In prison, I believe. Mr. Gonzalez? In prison? I'm not certain of that. Mr. Sturgis? The same. Mr. Martinez? Same. I think what we see here is not a joke, but a very great tragedy. I have no further questions. Mr. Chairman, may we have the photographs that were used earlier marked as exhibits for today's testimony? No, you're yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have.